Hello everyone, today we talk about the characters of the Eastern European monarchies in the second half of the Middle Ages. Uh, recently I created a dedicated playlist to the history of Eastern Europe during medieval times because it's those kind of neglected topics that you don't often um, see discussed around. And unfortunately, also from my perspective, and here I've mostly, mm, you know, summed up their history a bit all together. Um, and uh, this mm, s sounds like a, definitely a generalization. Also, in today's video, actually, we will consider chiefly Bohemia, Poland, and Hungary, um, with a later reflection on Russia and other considerations of other um, of other entities. Um, but I promise that in the future, when I will abandon this, let's say this kind of manualistic uh, level of uh, discussion, I will uh, definitely concentrate on uh, every and each one of these um, political entities, because that's, uh, in theory, at least uh, the future of Oshverpunk. Then everything may happen, and so I, I can't tell you. I'm. I will still be here. Obviously, I want to do it, but hey. Nobody knows. Um, so, but for now, I will just try to give this overall picture that, nevertheless, can be um, useful. I believe for someone, at least for someone that has never got interested in absolute terms, then I'm sure most of you, especially uh, medieval history um, lovers, are already pretty much uh, acquainted. So today, I would like to organize this pitch. Um, making certain general statements about all you know the, the characteristics the common characteristics of these monarchies and then looking at each one of them in a uh, you know from an individual perspective very simply very essentially so without getting too much into the matter so um introducing the topic um there are definitely certain characters that were shared not just between um, not sh not not just by the both the the Western and Eastern monarchies, but you know monarchies in general during medieval times, and we can definitely observe that after the 11th century, because today we start fundamentally from that, um, there is uh, all over Europe the uh, strengthening of certain certain uh, statual uh, entities, or better, the construction proper of certain statual entities, given the word state as a very uh, generic term uh, which fundamentally you have a, um, a not really a centralization but l let's say a accumulation of power under the uh, the uh, the control of a single uh, monarch in this case um, medieval times were for modern contemporary standards were sort of the centralized political uh, moments, let's say, where monarchies had this r very um, uh, low degree of centralization. I argued always that centralization, however, always exists. Um, it depends in, in every society in practice. It only depends on how you see it. Um, c centralization doesn't mean what starts happening. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean what starts happening with the modern age, with essentially a an abstract um, statal um, entity that gets the, the reference point that starts acting with permanent uh, structures, permanent um, uh, officials and so on and tries to evocate um, rights from the uh, communities in exchange for something else. Uh, centralization can also mean the degree of power that you basically are able to exercise by yourself as a single entity and therefore has um, taken in part this power away from, from others. Uh, it's very empirical, as you notice, but throughout all the Middle Ages, even in the very early ones, there, were, th there was a certain measure of centralization in the administration of these monarchies, um, in the organization of the army as well, um, and in general this stemmed from certain bare necessities that a country has to if anything, first of all, I believe to, to defend itself, but in order to defend itself, also to administrate resources, organization, and so on. So there are definitely also many analogies that uh, exist between the um, monarchic princely realities of Eastern and, and Balkanic Europe, 
um, with the uh, the Western European ones. Um, normally, we can say during the course of the 14th century, uh, Poland, um, Bohemia, uh, Serbia um, experienced this uh, orientation of the royal initiative towards a sort of um, legislative and, and juridical unification that passed essentially through the elaboration of certain norms that were destined to be fundamentally valid all over the territory of the kingdoms. So, uh, talking about the government apparatus, um, especially in Poland, in Bohemia and in Hungary, um, during these centuries went, um, th there was the development fundamentally of a tax collection system that was characterized by a certain regularity in the, uh, in the exactions, in the, in the collections, and it was built a body of functionaries that in fact depended on the sovereign. Um, that's the degree of centralization we were talking in part. Um, this was happening in fact in the same West, uh, in the same, I mean in the West in the same way. Um, and uh, furthermore there were certain military forces that were starting being organized under the royal control. This is also particularly important because these military forces were not, in practice, yet uh, part of a of a central army, of an army that depended directly and in all by the, the sovereign. Uh, this is a process that took centuries, uh, arguably even during the the, the, the very last uh, up to the very last m uh, modern age. It, it was you know this was uh, very difficultly. Um, achievable in, in practice, but the idea of being able to collect taxes, so to store resources and to use them for fundamentally paying also soldiers and, 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 and therefore tying them to the crown, well this is something really important in the development of such countries. This could happen in many ways, you know that all these countries also in Eastern Europe, just like it, it, it happened in Roman Germanic Europe, um, in, the, in their Slavic laws had the sort of general levy of the army. So theoretically, these were at the beginning uh, soci warrior societies that were in, to which you know the, every freeman had not just the duty, but in a certain sense the honor of participating, the privilege, the highest privilege of participating to the army, and the army was um, entrusted in this theoretical egalitarian form to a prince, fundamentally, that was chosen, usually, for its military prowess, uh, its, but in this sense also because of his uh, previous ability of, you know, engaging through, through you know, the, the distribution of resources, um, several clientels into the, this process, into this political and military process, that could lead the army effectively, and this is fundamentally the um, the origin a bit of all the monarchies in the uh, in the Indo-European world. In in the sense with with a leader uh, that is a leader of warriors, and that fundamentally makes a surplus through uh, the military success, uh, and therefore redistributes these goods to the to his warriors, and his warriors obviously follow him as long as he's an effective ruler, an effective leader. Uh, this is what happens all over medieval Europe in many ways. And it's from these dynamics that in fact the so-called states in this, um, say, monarchic princely, princely realities get, uh, I mean, become structured. Hmm? And this happens also very importantly in the moment of full sedentarization of certain populations that could be um, from the migration era had been in part semi-nomadic, fundamentally moving around and trying to find a permanent seat, then, or full nomadic sometimes, you know, coming from the steppes, um, and um, had um, eventually a great transformation in the moment in which they, they sedentarize, because now the uh, political and military um, dynamics didn't entail just a wandering around looting and seizing new land. Now, the, the great objective was seizing land. When this land was seized, this, pop uh, this um, population stopped uh, uh, 
fundamentally to, to move and were uh, and their social organization were was grounded now on land and this changes a freaking lot of things including the fact that uh, land uh, gives you this sort of um, more um, more direct source of income fundamentally and therefore allows a certain <coughs> uh, anyone who is settled um, to develop a sort of um, society on its own I mean a certain means of su sustainment that do not depend anymore on the leader but can be fundamentally drawn from from the local uh, resources given that these were all kind of in a clanic fashion all, the, all these um, actors had been in a clanic fashion military leaders on their own mm. there was a very strong military characterization um, of, of of Eastern Europe, but from you know the, after the migration era, these populations were still pretty much warlike, pretty much active, pretty much uh, dynamic, and also in, in movement. I mean, it took several centuries before even the mm, end of the migration era proper. That is, you know, normally from a Western, a strictly a narrowly Western perspective, is normally indicated to the sixth century. That that kept on moving and shifting, and also. In fact, uh, moving across Europe and resettling and so on. And this had entailed a great part of militarization of these societies. Now, the societies change because there is an increased stratification. Uh, who occupies the land tends to seize it on the base of its means. So there are aristocracies that are ever more, uh, ever stronger and ever more difficult to essentially to, to control or at least to to prevent their autonomous action from their, their land and this requires new statal structures that compensate to the, the loss uh, if you want of a national cohesion like it had been um, for because of the methods of, of cities out there in the in the migration era where you know people stuck to air not because they liked a central authority but simply because that was necessary to a certain extent in order to survive in that in that context. Now, um, th there is the ability of structuring something more permanent, also in terms of infrastructures, for instance. Um, and it's very interesting, I would say, in the history of, of Eastern Europe to observe the, um, the absorption of Western models at this time. Uh, talking about Hungary, um, Bohemia and Poland, this is all the more even, but um, f considering the, the Latin Germanic Empire, in the West that was in fact emanating these models, these institutional, political and military models. Uh, but this is true also with, uh, for Russia with, with, or with other Balkanic powers, um, uh, f with, with Byzantium for instance, particularly evident, also for Bulgaria, for Serbia also in part. And, uh, and therefore um, there are also certain uh, previous characteristics of these countries that made uh, them different in their institutional development from the West. In particular, I have a theory that I don't know whether it's correct or not, but I believe that um, in a certain sense um, you, we will see that fundamentally the Eastern monarchies um, in, um, during the late Middle Ages will grow uh, increasingly um, dominated by the local nobility. So uh, while in, in this previous part, let's say in the high medieval times, the initially these monarchies had been built, albeit with all the difficulties that every medieval monarchy could have in terms of centralization, with a relatively sound and solid structure. I mean, up to the 3rd and 14th century, Antis is like, like Bohemia, like Poland, were consistently, uh, obviously with all the differences of the case, um, were structuring themselves relatively well. And Poland had, you know, a, a moment of a bit of an intermittent uh, process into this. But Bohemia, for instance, Bohemia had uh, a great impact, especially during the 13th century. It, it, there was a, a process of even a containment uh, of the uh, nobiliar prerogatives, a tendency to, to develop other social stands that could counter um, this uh, centrifugal push of the aristocracy, a, a military expansion, a, um, a politics that was trying to, um, I would say, I, I don't like to say centralized, but to, um, let's see, find a better term, to attract at least, to, to draw more resources in the hand, to bring together in the hands of the sovereign. This is kind of more 
meaningful for, for medieval times and not really centralization because indeed centralization pertains to the idea of a sort of fixed institution that doesn't resent of um, of certain political dynamics that is there it's kind of monolithic and it can evolve but it's fundamentally a permanent structure here everything was not really put into still put potentially into discussion but it, it it's um, relations of power could, could really swing pretty hard so what you have fundamentally is an initial moment in the Eastern European monarchies in which things could really work well even towards a further um, uh, attraction and, and bringing together of the resources on, in the end of the story. Towards the late Middle Ages this starts to fundamentally get out of hand um, and, um, and these are also become fundamentally sort of elective monarchies in, in many cases they um, in, to which the nobility really gets the upper hand and it's no surprising in this sense that most of these monarchies, actually all of these monarchies Call, uh, will call foreign dynasties uh, in ruling into the uh, into their uh, uh, into their kingdoms. Um, this also will develop very characteristic di characteristic dynamics into these kingdoms. By the way, also were pretty much um, in contact between each other. I mean, there were certain um, there were often and also very complicated to reconstruct um, dynastic unions that tended to sum up the crowns of Bohemia, Poland, Hungary and um, try to in fact um, in a typical uh, medieval fashion to ex not really to achieve a an intensive uh, control on these on the single territories but extending the control of a single sovereign a single dynasty of more um, territories in order to to gather as many resources as possible because that was definitely more convenient for how the uh, political and social structures were were organized to then um, then in fact trying to, to go ask directly um, for resources within the, a single uh, boundary where a lot of resistance would have met from the side of the nobility um, and this idea that however um, the, the nobility had some prerogatives was not a new in um, I mean in general so in, in in Western Europe I mean that was the base of every both of the uh, to the Germanic and Slavic um, uh, laws fundamentally that you know the freeman theoretically was uh, th there was no one who was practically superior to a freeman in practice then eventually during the course of the Middle Ages we know that different there is a social stratification that is in part entailed in fact by the, econ the sedentarization, the economical development that brings several stands, several states also as they are called to exercise each one their own prerogatives but in this sense on a base that um, pre-existed um, um, and that, that was the one of, of the freemen theoretically speaking whose power could whose freedom in fact could could not be limited by the sovereign if not by a social contract in which it was the same freeman that um, that entrusted these resources to this this power to to, to a sovereign to to call them to call it back when if they had wished so this was kind of the the the, the birth of the seigneurial system as well everywhere in Europe and so on but there is a great difference because in the uh, you notice that this eastern um, monarchies, with the exception perhaps of certain parts of Hungary, were all in lands that had not belonged to the Roman Empire formally. Um, as we have explained several times, even when talking about Eastern European history, you know, these great areas of Central and Eastern and Northern Europe had been left fundamentally out of the Roman Empire, not because the Romans couldn't theoretically um, occupy these lands. The problem was that it was a uh, it was inconvenient for the Romans. The Romans reasoned in terms of costs, benefits, and their main goal was fundamentally to invade territories that could sustain their sedentary model of urbanization, maintaining the legions, um, fundamentally being able to Romanize also the local populations through, uh, through the market, through the economy. Where, um, and, and this limit is very much also um, climatic in many ways because if you don't have enough resources to sustain that uh, this becomes very very difficult that's the same reason why for instance the Romans at the end of the day left uh, Germany 
why uh, they didn't venture into Scotland, not because they couldn't seize them. Uh, the, the Romans had r practically no, 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 no trouble in doing such a thing. The problem was maintaining that. And that was the real problem. And if it was not convenient, no. So what happened, in fact, is that when uh, during the migration era, um, and, and therefore these base areas of Central and Eastern Europe remained, um, had, were characterized by a far more primitive social organization. They couldn't sustain something greater than, than a village, fundamentally. They had difficulties, in fact, for this also uh, environmental reasons to, 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 to stock uh, enough uh, quantities uh, of, of resources to, to build something more. They had troubles in maintaining uh, these this resources and so on. Um, the, um, I, I will have to make a video to explain how this actually happened because sometimes it was really a matter of lack of particular substances that could be found in um, the derived from things like wine, uh, from grapes, for instance, that were used to store, to preserve, and that really created a problem that, structurally speaking, could not be resolved uh, until you know civilization fundamentally went on. Also, not maybe just qualitatively, but just Additionally speaking, I mean, uh, civilization also has this um, starting point from which if men keep working and working and fundamentally uh, the things keep growing. So that this is how also in Eastern Europe, in spite of what whatever was the, the technological potential at that time, things went progressing and, and, and these areas went developing consistently also during the Middle Ages. Um, but up, up to that point it had not been so, and therefore the local societies had remained uh, more primitive and in this sense more egalitarian than in the West. Uh, just like it was in fact, um, what does it mean? It means that fundamentally uh, the aristocracies were relatively poor, that the freemen as, as, a, as a world body were generally uh, altogether more powerful than the elite. And this had brought to a sort of, um, to sort of democrat. Uh, I know, it, uh, I know it, it sounds um, uh, anachronistic, but it kind of makes sense if you take it etymologically speaking. These were kind of democratic societies, where you know a lot of importance was in fact given to personal freedom, as we have seen, individual freedom. Um, the idea that uh, decisions had to be taken collectively. Of course, the elites um, controlled. Uh, and and guided this uh, and guided society in, in many ways, but it was never like in the West. When the Germans settled in Western uh, lands, these were completely different, environmentally speaking, from from the uh, from the lands where they they came from in Central Europe, and they settled therefore in in um, in an environment that, although um, you know, crippled consistently by um, wars. Um, uh, epidemics, uh, uh, climatic change, um, had fundamentally remained uh, wealthy and could sustain a more, uh, a more structured, more developed society. That's the reason why in the West, in early medieval times, um, um, fundamentally the Romano-Germanic kingdoms are able to fundamentally maintain a sort of, a, a degree of unity that was unknown fundamentally in terms of, 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 of degree of permanency um, you know, of political structures and of infrastructures and so on than in Eastern Europe. This was a kind of a big problem, the, the most evi for, um, however, for some reasons, because if you take Gaul, for instance, that was the, fundamentally, the, the land where the, um, the ancient Roman structures had remained more solid than any other country in the, um, um, in, in the post-Roman Europe, let's say, you see in there that aristocracies um, had, funda the, the, the Frankish aristocracies had mixed with the local ones that had remained from senatorial times and had created this enormously powerful clientele that uh, were unknown, by the way, also in the rest of post-Roman Europe in, in for that size, um, <coughs> and had always had a a very important control of local political matters influencing directly also the crown. Excuse me, I drink a little. The, um, <coughs> the result is that it is with Carolingian Europe that is all the more evident 
is that fundamentally the um, these aristocracies take over central Tory. And now this is very uh, difficult to explain now, I don't know even when I'm making exactly this example, but it's just for saying that in this, uh, with the uh, exportation, say the export of the Basilatic beneficiary system of Frankish uh, origin, what happens is that the uh, rather weak uh, s central Romano-Germanic um, Statal systems fundamentally get overrun by this feudal aristocracy, which would become a feudal aristocracy in, in, in aristocracy in the centuries, and well, and will in a certain sense strangle a little bit um, what was left of monarchic power. This is a problem that engulfs the West chiefly between the ninth and the eighth century, also the eleventh. But paradoxically, it's from this same feudal system that from the eleventh century onwards the Western European monarchies began to structure on the same feudal base, and therefore, because all of these powerful aristocracies had remain, had made up at, at that point sort of states within states, so it was relatively easy once you could have an influence on them and to control them to fundamentally gather them uh, uh, into the construction of an institutional system in which the monarchy was fundamentally strengthened by all of these very powerful uh, entities. Uh, that, uh, that were interested in participating into into the kingdom in a way or another. Of course, there were ferocious struggles for fundamentally also um, you know, countering the centralizing push of the of the monarchy in these kingdoms. But um, <clears throat> this, at the end of the day, um, made able the Western European monarchies to create, however, powers that were based on much more developed. Uh, and pre-existing um, structures than in what Eastern Europe had happened. And in Eastern Europe, Europe instead, I believe that the initial um, functionality of the monarchies in, in, in this 11th, uh, 14th century period, um, which, albeit very progressive, was due, in fact, to the absence of these extremely powerful uh, aristocracies, initially speaking, because it, it, it's as if the political balance was shifted in the favor of freemen. So not that it's not that controlling freemen is much easier than controlling um, the the, uh, the nobility fundamentally, but still you can't fundamentally um, the the freemen are more difficult. On the contrary, in fact, they're more uh, relatively more difficult to organize. But at the same time, they exactly because they're more difficult to organize, they j also tend not to organize themselves into something particularly more complex. So y if you have enough power on your own as a dynast, not just as a monarch, but just one of those princes that rule around, you can um, relatively easily um, control their action through your military deterrent. So I think that partially uh, the kings in Eastern uh, European, in the Eastern European monarchies, could uh, play much more easily on. First of all, the um, more co the, the, the more contained um, power of aristocracies, at least compared to to the Western ones, that were enormously more developed. Um, also, in terms of military power, economical power, and so on. And two, on this um, fundamentally still tribal mindset that uh, and, and militarized mindset that existed into the populations into their for their general levies their this uh, in, in their districtual organizations that altogether were kind of functioning still as a kind of a cohesive system when led by a single ruler to whom they could entrust in fact their military and economical Energies and so on. Now, naturally, the uh, when I when instead the 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 aristocracies began to uh, develop more consistently after the great expansion of the European um, system towards uh, towards uh, the low Middle Ages. Well, now the aristocracies are more difficult to counter. And since even uh, in here the 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 Eastern European monarchies didn't have the same uh, old um, uh, roots and 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 um, and political social 
um, institutions that uh, the, the in, in Western Europe existed since a long time, since the Roman times fundamentally, um, they uh, didn't have enough antibodies, let's say, to counter the, the growth of the nobility at one point. They could control it for good for several centuries, but then now it was very, very difficult to, to keep doing it, and they got practically choked and were not uh, not really overthrown but at at, at one point they um they 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 also failed to provide a sort of continuity uh, that sometimes was a, di a merely dynastic in many ways you know there were certain dynasties that simply went extinct think about uh, all of the three majors think about the premislets or uh, the 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 Piast or the Arpads, so that they they all have this kind of common uh, dynamic. So it's as if these monarchies had in Eastern Europe had been advantaged by their initial uh, tribal and relatively egalitarian organization um, in the first centuries of uh, after the year 1000, and that were eventually, uh, however, not uh, resistant enough to counter the push the, of the nobility once that this these private forces went strengthening themselves into into the uh, following centuries. And this was a very serious difficulty because even if you see on the map, I mean kingdoms like the one of, of Poland, the one of Hungary, the one of Bohemia were weren't also neither particularly uh, you know small entities. They were actually pretty big chunks of Europe. Uh, sometimes what is interesting also uh, Bohemia, uh, at the time of its um, cons you know, initial construction from between the, the 9th and 10th century, became fundamentally one of the most powerful entities in the area, in Central Europe. They had this initial unity that is particularly impressive, but at the same time you realize that, and especially through the extension of their territories, this is particularly even to, evident for me with Poland, because Hungary... Hungary kind of maintained a certain unity. It was uh, Hungary also was more like of an empire than a kingdom to tell it all. But with the case of Poland, it's more imminent. Poland was relatively wide. Nevertheless, the PS never actually managed to to exercise a very strong control. Aside from Boleslav I or Casimir III, and um, so this, even uh, you, you you find in here certain interludes between in, in between that. Which authority, w the royal authority, was relatively, relatively weak. They they never managed, in fact, to 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 give a, a um, an orderly central asset to the world system. They ended up eventually losing ground to the nobility that, also historically speaking, through the late Middle Ages, the, the modern age, uh, kept fundamentally um, in check the uh, the royal institutions and simply made its grant increasingly. Uh, increasing autonomies that uh, sometimes have been sung, even uh, ideologically speaking, as a sort of for a sort of democracy that was um, uh, uh, proceeding fundamentally on the footsteps of the ancient egalitarianism of the, the, the local traditions. Then instead, created a, a non-state, fundamentally as just a sum of private domains that eventually were swallowed famously in the 18th century by this. Uh, way more centralized entities like Russia that not so su surprisingly in this sense was was an eastern entity we will see uh, later why it had reached that but also naturally the the the, the western world with with Austria with Prussia uh, that at that point had obviously gone past beyond the 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 if you want the medieval particularism that was characteristic however some many other modern uh, entities, including that one. Um, so, um, th there are environmental reasons as well. Uh, as we have said before, these were lands that had a uh, relatively slow development throughout the, the medieval times. Um, you can't say really that these were generally l less powerful entities. I mean, they, they had the men, they, they had the resources, they had the, the work, actually powerful kingdoms, even if you take the same Poland, in spite of all this um, progressive decentralization, I mean, up to the you know the, the 16th to 17th century, it was something pretty functional. It stopped. Uh, it had a hell of a military organization. It managed to move resources to project its power uh, far, even outside of its boundaries. So um, this had not uh, really hampered the actual um, management of, of a the, the functioning of 
of an institutional entity, but um, it had sensibly shifted the uh, in, in, in inner um, uh, the inner balance in favor of uh, the aristocracy of private uh, um, um, of, of private um, assets that were not interested in a crown to fundamentally to develop further and to have a, a greater control and to d to turn into something more modern and and centralized um, and, and 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 this was paid in fact in the end. So uh, I wanted to say something else I don't remember, but um, oh yeah, the the environmental problems. You know, the idea that these were also you know take climate, take ancient or medieval uh, technological potential. You know, it makes a, a big difference to be you know in the south or in the north of Europe. I mean, the cold climate is something that sensibly weakens your economy. It creates a hell of a problem at the time. Um, and and that's the reason why these areas of wide areas of northern of eastern Europe kind of developed, uh, you know, more slowly. Uh, it, it, it's a microscopical evidence, and and and, and this also naturally and, and also let's say closeness to civilization was was a problem. Um, if for for example, if you look at Bohemia or Hungary, well. These were still kind of very close to entities like the German Empire, uh, in the case of Hungary, the, the Byzantine one, um, uh, and uh, with Poland, for instance, this is uh, this is more difficult. Poland was more distant from this um, from these uh, centers, at least in its uh, eastern part. Uh, in fact, most of its um, you know power was controlled was uh, concentrated in, in, in the western area uh, of, the, of the kingdom. And, and and even later, if you take the the dynastic union that helped with uh, Lithuania at the end of the uh, of the 14th century, that eventually was uh, formally you know sanctioned in 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 the 16th, because Lithuania kept fundamentally swinging between Poland and Russia because it was still kind of undecided in some ways. But uh, even there, Lithuania came to encompass the Grand Duchy of Lithuania came to encompass within in, into the into the Confederacy an enormous amount of land in the East, but fundamentally it was always Poland that albeit more contained, uh, extensionally speaking, had the kind of the greater power, because it was more leaning toward the West, so uh, into a world that uh, was kind of um, even influencing, emanating, uh, you know, more uh, structuring influences, I would say, uh, in, into those countries that were in fact more similar in fact, you know there is a very striking uh, similarity indeed. By uh, it's difficult to draw effectively a a true um, a true line of uh, demarcation between c Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, this has been a great problem also um, politically and um, militarily speaking, because objectively, if you see between the Germanic and the Slavic world, there's hardly ever been a, a kind of stable frontier um, even when uh, you know this Eastern European kingdoms kind of settled down, they got feudalized in turn because that's also what is incredibly important to stress they were taking now the fundamentally Frankish and Roman models they were uh, adopting feudalism they were adopting uh, the Roman um, Catholicism and they um, were uh, in this sense Participating to this great group of the, you know, of the, of the civilized nations. Think about Bohemia; that was uh, initially like a duchy and, and eventually like a kingdom, de facto incorporated into the Holy Roman Empire and even became an elector. Um, so, uh, where's the border there? Where's the, 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 the? These were all very fluid systems that also kind of um, molded themselves by this continuous interaction that existed with the West, in part. And we will see it now. Uh, this was all, all a kind of a great introduction to, to make some points, but let's say also being closer to civilization is something that helps you developing something, a more structured um, uh, domain. And um, so, first of all, going back to the, the beginnings, there is a um, there is also a very um, 
interesting factor that has to do with religion. We still haven't made a video specifically on this, but I mean, the great moment of the, the evangelization of, of Central and Eastern Europe that was uh, not just a important for the history of Christianity in itself, religiously, ecclesiologically speaking, but also politically, and also military in, in many ways speaking, because um, indeed there was, first of all, a, a competition between the uh, Western and Eastern Church that point to win the, over this um, this um, very based amount of populations that inhabited the, 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 the Central Europe, Eastern Europe, the Balkans, etc. Um, and uh, w for uh, either one of the other church, so that were in competition with each other, but also it was from the perspective of this uh, of, of these lands and the the political entities that dwelled in them, it was a very important opportunity to fundamentally strengthen their internal organization, and royal control was fundamentally arising through that. Um, not very differently from the West, but probably more than in the West, uh, the Eastern European monarchies were um, were sensibly um, aided in in the, their uh, the, the promotion of their uh, their authority and the strengthening of their their the, the, and the their kingdoms as institutions by the church. I mean, the church was at this point a very uh, a fundamental unifying factor that um, was importing for the first time in those lands a true, a truly centralized uh, institution, because the church fundamentally really was, at least in comparison to the, to the secular one that was uh, also orientating itself towards the centralized models with the Vassalatic Beneficiary System. But also the Vassalatic Beneficiary System was important for these as, uh, barely structured domains, as we have seen in Eastern Europe, to be seized, because uh, it was paradoxically even in, if it was a decentralized form, something more um, that could um, represent a more gluing factor uh, uh, f uh, for the uh, for the construction of, of a monarchy in terms of relation between kings and, and aristocrats than the pre-existing tribal slash egalitarian structure really was. In fact, that strengthening of the monarchies we were talking, excuse me, of the aristocracies. Uh, that we were talking about before didn't actually occur just you know uh, autonomously. Of course, I don't know when the hungers I don't know uh, settled down and began to to you know to dwell as a sedentary um, a sedentary um, clans etc. They they were developing a local power and its own a formal local organization. But definitely uh, feudalism was very um, eagerly imported by the Eastern. Uh, European sovereigns, because this um, fundamentally um, contained uh, this hierarchical model that uh, could define, since the beginning, the um, the, uh, the 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 hierarchies. In fact, the the, the various uh, the relation of dependency that had to exist um, uh, from uh, for the um, uh, uh, for the, the the local resources on the sovereign. Um, so this is particularly important because at the time the the, the, few, the the developing at least feudal system was already not very formally much institutionalized. However, already was kind of the most modern thing ever. Uh, it, it was um, very profitable for this um, Eastern monarchies to to get what w really worked best um, and to to mold it at it, at their own. Um, at their own consumption, consumption fundamentally for for structuring their their domains, um, and we will see later. In fact, this the feudalism was also a way to attract other other um, other aristocracies within the the kingdoms that could counter the local ones. This is particularly important. What you see during the twelfth, the thirteenth century, that happens pretty much. Um, everywhere in these countries, uh, but especially I would say in Bohemia and in Hungary, I mean the practice of settling uh, Western knights as, uh, I mean, knights coming literally from everywhere, like from G Germany first, because it was kind of closer, but also from England, from Spain, from Italy, um, etc. I mean, and settling them in their own domains to fundamentally um, uh, 
uh, have a, a new aristocracy that represented a minority into the kingdom compared to the the ethnic local one, but that in in, in this sense was depending uh, on the uh, on the success of the sovereign and therefore could back him and also was bringing certain even technical um, skills and knowledge how to fight you know this uh, style of uh, very very heavy uh, heavily armored. Uh, horsemen that you know uh, that was developing in the West that also in, in the East didn't quite exist in the same fashion. When I made that video on um, medieval Polish tactics between the 11th and 13th century, you 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 can see there even uh, the the process of Westernization of the uh, let's say let's call it this way so the Frankization if if you prefer of the of most of this uh, Eastern. Uh, European um, armies uh, that initially relied on uh, perhaps even on, on more cavalry than in the West, or in the West. But it was fundamentally lighter cavalry. Was more resenting of the, um, you know, uh, the absence, in fact, of this uh, great feudal estates that fundamentally didn't exist in there. So uh, maybe th th it, it was um, a more democratic cavalry, if you want. So and. Um, it with a much higher um, uh, that 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 you know because probably more more people were armed, more people could go on horseback. The the, the free men were kind of uh, more well off than in proportion than than the nobility than than in the West. Definitely, we know in the West the nobility now was like the ultra ultra elite, enormously rich. They they managed everything. The rest of the masters now was being transformed in peasantry. Um, in the West, in Eastern, it was not like that. But progressively, with the import of feudalism, also you can see it from from the army beautifully that this uh, Eastern European monarchies get Westernized. They start having the same uh, kind of um, equipment, the same kind of tactics, uh, the same kind of armies than in the West. Albeit, you know, with still some kind of ex more exotic feature that uh, that also corresponds to this political balance. For instance, the uh, as far as I know, uh, every perhaps not Bohemia, but surely Hungary, Hungary many times, and Poland uh, at least once, if I'm not wrong, uh, at least in, in medieval times, they set they were settling um, peoples of the steppes within their own territories. Uh, with Hungary, it was kind of normal because the the Hungarian, the major uh, crown had been born through literally through the migration of uh, peoples of the steppes into the Pannonian Basin, just like the Avars had done back in the day. So there was this permanence of the idea that uh, they were kind of all... that the, the Hungarian kings were still kind of the steppes overlords in, uh, in Pectore, fundamentally. Um, and they could settle, and it could be a point of reference for all these kind of refugees that were fleeing the the, the, the devastating destructions that happened in in the, in the steppes warfare, and could take a refuge into the Pannonian plain. It was a very very profitable measure for the Hungarian crown to have fundamentally a sort of private army uh, with this direct bond, uh, direct relation that resembled, in fact, the one existing in the steppes between the overlord and these uh, tribes. Uh, the, like the Kumans, for instance, were settled into uh, into Hungary, and that worked like I can't say like a Praetorian guard because it's uh, anachronistic and it, it it really doesn't display that. But you know, just imagine this Kumans settling in there as a at this point a completely allogen entity compared to the rest of the nobility that now was kind of a not h even Hungar anymore, but properly Hungarian. You know that Hungary is not properly a Slavic country because it, in fact, it speaks a Finnic language. But you know, yeah, th these areas were had been also Slavicized, and just the elite maintained this uh, kind of more originally uh, Ugro-Finnic character, also in, in language and so on, and um, that was naturally extended to the rest of the population as well because Hungarians still speak; uh, they don't speak a Slavic language, but they. Um, no, that were transforming naturally. It was something very different from the one on the uh, from from the populations and the steps. Now these Kumans, they were still working not as in fact the feudal lords that the local Hungarian nobility had turned into, but as really tribesmen still. Now we're following as a sort of private army of the king that therefore was defended 
from the rest of the nobility by this power, by these uh, horsemen that, by the way, were had a, you know, a, eventually they they also ended up to sedentarize and to blend with the rest of the local population. Um, but initially they were pretty much they they maintained their high, uh, I mean, the first, the second generation, their their high military quality of, of the steps as mounted uh, that were very important also in the conflicts that that were fought. And to think about the Battle of Markfeld, there was one that brought the Habsburgs on the on the Austrian uh, or better that secured uh, the Austrian throne for, for the Habsburg well this, that was one thanks to the participation of Stephen IV of Hungary, uh, Hungary and his Cumans that went there in thousands and he was the, 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 the Hungarian king was also half Cuman because his father the former king of Hungary had um, had married a Cuman princess so um, this happened also in Poland. I, th if I think in, fort in the early 14th century there were certain Cumans that were settled down in there. This happened in Russia as well. Uh, the Russians distinguished, especially the Russians naturally had been much more in contact with the this kind of uh, uh, Turkish, uh, Turkish populations uh, since ever. Because like, you know, think about the Cumans, in fact, they were stretching now the patching eggs. Um, they had been extending their power in this area of <coughs> excuse me, the Ukraine, initially speaking. Then also across the the, the Carpathians, uh, and, and and so they, 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 they had always been there. But for instance, when the Mongols arrived, that were now completely different because they came in fact from very far. Um, the, the Russians distinguished something they called uh, I don't know how it, whether in Russian is pronounced correctly. But they called them Svoy Pagania, which means our own pagans. I mean the Tartar, the excuse me, the, the Turkish populations that had dwelled in Russia up to that point, distinguishing from the Tartars that were now completely external. So uh, also stressing the fact that these Turkic, Turkish pop local Turkish populations were had always been coexisting with the Russians and were living with them and were in fact also partly absorbed. Then eventually the Russian nobility absorbed also part of the Tartar one. I made some videos about that. If you go in Medieval Slavs playlist you find um, I've been discussing about Russia in that specific case. But in general, in thinking exactly about the Mongol conquest, you realize how also these eastern kingdoms were fully exposed also to these waves of peoples of the steppes, historically. I mean, the, the Mongols basically arrived, uh, they invaded everything, they arrived just at the gates of Germany the gates of Bohemia. I mean, uh, um, uh, Lenica is in Poland, but it's very, very close to, to Bohemia, if I'm not wrong. Um, the, the Mongols swept and destroyed the Kievan Rus. They, they destroyed, raised to the ground also Poland. In, in Poland, we know that the, I don't know how, how they're called, the Grodny, I think, these um, original, I mean, traditional fortresses of, of the of the poles that were usually built in in timber in in dirt and so on, they were completely raised to the ground. We know archaeologically speaking that after the Mongol conquest, the, the poles rebuilt everything in stone now also to prevent. So just think how um, the the pressure the the of the metal so still is the, the 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 threat that also in this area existed given the, inst the general instability. So it's a pity also that these uh, Eastern European territories produced less sources than the West, obviously enough. Uh, sometimes when you read the sources, it seems like you are a couple of hundreds of years of, 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 this, of, of, of difference in terms of development, because these were less developed countries in, in, in many ways. Also, uh, urbanism, as you can imagine, was much less developed. Uh, Roman Europe from from uh, from England to to Sicily uh, was definitely um, urbanized. Uh, there were naturally areas that were more or less urbanized that had known that model of Roman urbanization. Eastern Europe wasn't really like that. Um, the uh, there is a new uh, uh, urbanization, and in fact, in fact, uh, starts developing in the from the High Middle Ages to the Old Middle Ages. Very important centers are founded. But also in here, we realize that this was all the more, even it were, as long as you know, it was closer to the West fundamentally, and the rest of the Eastern Europe remained uh, remained largely uh, rural. Were, were not even wild because it was difficult to claim, you know, swamps. Uh, thinking about the Pripyat marshes, thinking about even what 
Courland, what Lithuania could be at the time. I mean, even environmentally speaking, these were very important factors in the development of the local. And the same goes for Northern Europe, by the way, and it's the same exact thing. I mean, look at the the, the develop the institutional developments of Scandinavia were extremely slow. Um, but an important thing I would say is that this development also passed through uh, this um, Latin Germanic models in many ways. We have seen it for the church that was importing a, um, and we will see it now with the king's uh, saints, um, were, was importing fundamentally a uh, sanitary model because the, uh, the, the Roman, uh, the, Roman uh, the Roman church was fundamentally based on the idea that Every diocese should be in in a city proper. So even in Germany, you know, you, you could see this difference progressively through that the Western Germany was much more urbanized because it, it was part of the Roman Empire, and the rest was progressive, only progressively urbanized through the expansion of um, political and social structures on Frankish uh, model and new cities were founded and so on. So the Slavs naturally had their own previous centers villages and towns that progressively went on developing, um, chiefly during, uh, along the rivers, um, were very naturally very important in, in medieval times, especially during the, second, the, the phase of uh, the second invasions, the seas were not sh uh, safe because of the, the, the Vikings in the north, the Saracens in the south. So also this, uh, the rebirth of high, med in high medieval times starts from, uh, from the heart of Europe, from central Europe in part, uh, from Central Europe meant in, in the inter interland Europe where the uh, river waterways were were uh, were f fundamental for economy and you see such big uh, cities like you know are important like Buda uh, and Pest like Prague like Krakow uh, and so on so all these centers that uh, start building uh, even if modest modestly compared to the West but substantially and they become to expand Prague will become in fact in 14th century the 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 greatest uh, the most important center in Europe culturally speaking um, it's um, so they had their own development it was um, however on relatively different basis from the the Western ones and the rest of the countries remained however on average largely not as much ur urbanized as like it was happening in the West this was very important politically speaking. It's also one of the reasons why the um, the the local um, the local uh, sovereigns tried to to naturally to 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 support the development of urban centers because urban centers, as states as stands, uh, social stands could counter the nobility. Ottokar of Bohemia. Um, uh, was a great founder of cities. It, it, it gave many privileges of cities to cities uh, because that was a way for uh, for using them naturally, also logistically speaking. Um, for just thinking about the importance that Vienna had in the uh, in the expansion of his own uh, uh, in, of his own power, logistically speaking, etc., uh, against Hungary uh, into Austria as well, um, because it could counter the nobility. And the lack of solid urban centers, like it happened in the West, definitely w was a factor, very important factor, that eventually brought to the decline of the uh, central uh, character of Eastern um, European monarchies. Um, so it was a largely, m much more largely rural world where the nobility took over, and this in turn brought, even as a consequence, was also a cause, a further was a both a cause of a consequence of the lack of development of, of of consistent urban centers, because also the nobility now was more facilitated to stem the emergence of urban centers. So this this is, and this is also evident in modern in the modern age. I mean, these were countries that wh while uh, the, the West was progressively uh, you know expanding commercially with mercantilism through this all this uh, urban net eventually brought the set the premises for industrialization Eastern Europe remained largely rural till the the, 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 the previous centuries uh, the, the last century so this is um, important in, in the overall um, 
uh, say let's call it political geography, which is a disgusting term, but in my opinion, but um, y you get you get what I mean. But going back to the origin, we were talking about this um, Saint Kings fundamentally that were very important for the founding of the uh, of the Eastern European monarchies. Importantly, uh, Venceslas of Bohemia, Václav I, in fact, Duke of Bohemia from 921 to 929, and also, more famously, also of Stephen of, of Hungary, <coughs> was uh, uh, king and, uh, in a certain sense, founder, in fact, of the same uh, Hungarian, uh, Christian Hungarian kingdom, we ruled between 997 and, one, uh, and 1038. Uh, Venceslas, or Václav, if you, you prefer, uh, was Duke of Bohemia. In fact, we have his, um, I've seen it was the first born son of the Duke of Bratislav. And uh, he uh, reached uh, to, uh, he ascended to power in uh, of Bohemia in 920, 20, uh, 2021, and um, and first under the tutelage of uh, his uh, his mother Dragomir, and he is famous now. Naturally, also the the documentation is relatively what it is. It has to be contextualized. His uh, and this this emphasis on the Christian side is uh, is not wrong. It's not pure propaganda, but definitely work pretty pretty hard. Uh, I mean, pretty well for the 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 also in in favor of the political legitimization of these monarchies, because it naturally conferred them prestige in uh, I mean in in a Christian sense, also uh, being backed by the the ecclesiastical elites and so on. So it was particularly important, and um, he uh, he used at this time mostly German missionaries because at this time. Um, it was also prominent to to draw the 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 the, the actual Christian personnel uh, the, for an evangelization. And now, so you understand, in locally speaking, where was fundamentally all still a pagan world, uh, so that you understand also in here the the continuous um, dialogue, the continuous bond, the continuous blending with the with the West. Uh, the continuous contact with the West that was uh, helping these monarchs to to strengthen their 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 power, and um, and, and, and through these German missionaries, he uh, uh, Václav uh, managed to to spread Christianism, uh, Christianity in this uh, still pagan, largely pagan country, and this um, his his reign naturally got Bohemia close to the West, both from an ecclesiastical point of view, because remember, it was not yet to be, it had yet to be decided whether these churches would fit into the, the Western or the Eastern one. In the case of Bohemia, well, that's uh, the, kind of the most Westernized of all these Eastern monarchies that we're seeing for obvious reasons. Um, and, um, and, um, and at the same time, and also from a political one, in fact, and um, and in 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 uh, in 929, uh, also the sovereignty of the German King Henry I was recognized. Um, so this could be very profitable because in here it's not that the Bohemians were were particularly happy you know, for anyone going to to you know to rule in their own land. But this was just a formal recognition of sovereignty for for legitimizing the elite, for legitimizing the monarchy. Naturally, the not that the German monarchy was that more developed uh, at this time than the Bohemian. I mean, it was, yeah, it was can arguably more developed, but still Germany was a kind of a group of, of duchies similarly to, to Bohemia, in fact. So it was now just a, a, you know, a sort of big clientele with, with, uh, with benefits and, uh, you know, and, uh, were shared chiefly by the elites in this moment of great construction of, in fact, also the ideologically speaking, of the uh, imperial and royal authority. Here we are in the Ottonian age, so it's a moment in which imperial ideology starts to be also developed uh, in terms of th uh, 
of theoretical um, of political theory and and this was a very attractive very interesting for these Slavic rulers because now they, they understood the true those same um, means and true backing that you know that uh, legitimizing authority they could in turn strengthen their own power at home and this is particularly even that you find it all over all around the let's say the, the German Empire I mean even even in Denmark, in even in places like, because you see it also in the material culture. These were, um, especially the elites now, were kind of I don't know, buying uh, Western-made weaponry, wearing uh, in a kind of Western style because they they wanted to fit into that model of leadership that, at the eyes of their own subjects, could be seen as, in fact, something superior to what they had been used to, to see in their own land, and it now was exemplified by these um, foreign overlords that were, ho nevertheless, however, very close to their, own, to their own land. So Bohemia is kind of the path opener to that, this direction because it was also geographically closer. It had more in direct interests. Bohemia also famously intervened um, very often into the internal matters of the Ger the German kingdom, uh, eventually in the eleventh, in the twelfth century, you know, thirteenth. So was already always in fir always in first line, let's say, to 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 seize these opportunities, very very cleverly, I would say as well. Um, and so, Baclav's uh, program also was adopted by his own successor. Mm -hmm. So it became Christianity became the tradition of the Czechs sovereigns. Um, this went along also with the relations with the empire, and um, and um, uh, the the Václav is, um, I believe, the founder also of the Rotunda of Saint Beatus at uh, in the uh, I believe it's called Hradny, uh, the castle of Prague, where famously. Enough and the um, also in in, in this uh, the, the this rotunda is is, is is regarded at least I believe as the first monumental construction in in Bohemia that was executed on the was carried out on the uh, Western models. Um, Baklav should be also the first the coiner of the first Bohemian currency. Uh, the dinar of, of Saint uh, Venceslas, and this was also particularly important. Mints and coin, min, uh, coin minting was were definitely a uh, very important instrument of power that could legitimize, in this sense, the the, the royal authority. Uh, that also equated to um, you know to possessing, to showing, to possess a, a certain amount of wealth because that was basically where where it started from um, and that that wealth was um, certified I mean it was kind of guaranteed so that that was uh, you know uh, metal that had that particular value with that particular symbol so that was a, a very important mean of uh, control of also the political and of a, a sort of political thermometer of the monarchic power and um and this um you know you you realize that these were kind of foreign models in many ways now there is this this great debate that is proper of several historiographies you know considering the uh, local let's say ethnic nobility as kind of a national one now naturally this is an anachronistic um interpretation there was at this point no thing like a real national identity of course um, th there was a common feeling, there was a common identity, even if, even if a common language, um, but the, the boundaries of this were difficultly, um, uh, um, you know, definable. Uh, it was more the construction around these new centers of power, around these new monarchies and, and princely uh, um, authorities that was defining really a, a sort of proto-national identity very slowly now in the 10th century it's very very early for speaking about this but uh, uh, this naturally was favored in part by geography by certain uh, you know evident um, conglomerations of, 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 of people that 
kind of shared kind of some same um, same events in the, the, they, that brought them to to develop their own their own entity but um the here it's, it's still important to observe that the the same act of centralization or how we have defined it before this way of bringing together power under the, the, the hand of the sovereigns was adverse by the local aristocracy in part this is this has always happened basically this is the middle ages in a nutshell there was always a resisting force to the strengthening of monarchies that said okay we don't want to obey to this who is this person we have to obey to fundamentally and that's why it's very important the process of sanctification the uh, the process of, of christianization in the first place the uh, the adoption of a uh, ecclesiastical hierarchy because these were all means through which the monarch could be legitimized and naturally there was a sort of reaction that was backed also in a sort of uh, in an identitary fashion because we've seen that in the sense th the locals were still not Christian, were pagan uh, the models now that also Venceslas were drawing from were essentially Western models at this point. So the local nobility was sort of making it a, a point of also of local identity versus kind of external identity, very, very, you know, in a very shaded way, as you can imagine. But this is a constant that would go on also in other countries. Um, the, the, the idea that the local nobility was stressing its ethnic origins sometimes, even inventing, thinking about Sarmatism in Poland. At a certain point, uh, the, the, the local nobility in there, for instance, was very xenophobic. Xenophobia existed in the Middle Ages. It was actually very strong. These things that they tell you today to make you think that now we are all the bad guys, we've got xenophobic or racist. But xenophobia actually always existed. Um, and it was stressed sometimes in this political orientation to f by the local no ethnic nobility to fundamentally claim their own prerogatives. It's not that they were xenophobic for re I mean, of course, some of them were actually xenophobic, but the, the idea is that if you stressed a, the, the idea that the foreigners were kind of enemies, you could, um, um, you could defend your own internal prerogatives. And guess what was ruling at the time? The local nobility. So that was a very clear, you know, very cunning way to, to stress, um, to, to, to fundamentally to contrast to stamp the decentralizing push of the monarchy by saying you're doing it now in foreign models. This is all particularly evident when also these monarchies begin to, excuse me, these kingdoms begin, the, 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 at that point the nobility of these kingdoms starts to elect foreign kings. Uh, this is kind of a paradox apparently, but it's not really because they were electing foreign kings substantially to, to uh, bring um, to have a king who, whose power was not deeply rooted locally, that was depending, in fact, on the election on behalf of the, uh, of the uh, by the side of the the aristocracy. And uh, sometimes it was a naive hope because there were also very uh, you know certain uh, foreign dynasties that also uh, you know affirmed themselves consistently. Think about the Luxembourgs, always in Bohemia. Um, but um, but in, and in this sense, the, the the monarchs were keeping to try also in the modern age. Uh, the, this foreign dynasties think about in Poland, um, uh, think about Poland um, that were trying to build something more centralized to have that minimal, you know, to to increase minimally the control on 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 the kingdom uh, against the nobility. And of course, the nobility would develop this anti-foreign feeling. But because it was saying now this is kind of a foreigner he is uh, we called him to 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 rule in here and he has to obey to us if he doesn't he's just an enemy so these were always kind of these sort of tendencies and it's interesting because the the monarchies that were built at this time uh not just in eastern europe but i would say in eastern europe more but in in the world continent this time were pretty much pushing for an international for international relations because they understood that the best way to legitimize themselves was getting also this external approval 
getting um, in the because even if it was too difficult to make to make a way through the nobility at a local level, and um, that would have caused a sensible sensitive sensible problems because at that point they would have had to, to actively fight against them, which always happened by the way, because there were always kind of wars between the monarchy and the kind of rebellious um, uh, 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 nobles. Um, there were sometimes even members of the same royal family, as always, that were rebelling one against the other, having contrasting uh, interests. That, by the way, tells you also how ra really fragmented also the centers of power were within the same as the same kingdoms. Think about the, the Polish duchies, for instance, and how the PS dynasty fundamentally spread all over them, but it was very difficult to, to make them work well along because they also partly went ruling in there from an external from the external was kind of obliged to follow also the, the logics of the of the local you know the local interests and so on in order to rule. So this was a, an extremely complicated game where the um, the external aids were sometimes even more important than the the in internal activity, and um, in fact, uh, the same Vaclav of, of of Bohemia died uh, in a in a plot that was uh, carried out by the, his brother Boleslav. So, and, and Vaclav became a sort of legendary figure. Um, venerated as uh, by the the, uh, the the Bohemians as a, a sort of martyr of, of the faith, um, this gave an enormous prestige to um, to the di to the dynasties uh, to to the kingdom in, in itself. Um, it was it was ver was very important in medieval times to to descend from from some from you know uh, from a family who had had a saint. And this also very much influenced the, also the the, the attitudes of the various dynasties. Were dynasties that you know had okay, we had a saint back in the day. We're a saint dynasty point. We can do whatever we want. There were other dynasties who didn't have saints in their family, and, and therefore they they stressed instead their the pietistic uh, behavior of uh, their own members. It was the case of the Habsburgs, for instance, of Austria that had and had, for instance, a a, a holy, uh, I mean, a saint in their own uh, among their ancestors. So, this, um, so also these founders. Naturally, it was stressed that the the foundation of these kingdoms had happened through obviously the evangelization as well. Naturally, this process was much more complicated, was much more progressive. But it's at the same time undeniable that uh, this process also passed consistently through the Christianization, through the um, through the monarchic siding with the church and their cooperation. This happened actually everywhere in Europe. This is particularly even kind of everywhere. It's particularly even with the Ottonians at this time, uh, contemporaries of Baclav. But this is true also for the French monarchy uh, that in fact, uh, you know, this in the 10th and 11th century now, was strengthening the, its um, ties with the church exactly in anti nobiliar function because at that point uh, the church was siding with kind of the more uh, with the central authority. This is also a tendency that happened quite often because the central authority was theoretically the legitimate public authority that could enforce a general order and could defend the ecclesiastical goods. So naturally, the church had its own. Um, exemptions, privileges, and and uh, and so on. So uh, it always searched at the local level for for a stable central authority who could protect its assets by the rapacious, uh, you know, policies policies of the uh, local nobility. Um, and um, and uh, and naturally, yeah, the. the Ventures, uh, Vaclav became a, a local hero and protector of, of the kingdom and so on. Even uh, Charles IV of Luxembourg, uh, Charles IV of Bohemia, made 
um, had made in honor of the saint the new uh, royal uh, bohemian uh, crown. Uh, I think in 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 Czech Republic it's also a um, there's also a, a national a national holiday dedicated to uh, to to Vaclav. So these are figures that. Aside from the the real historical relevance, and naturally at this time is kind of a bit lost in the mist of, of you know of the lack of evidence and in, in, in so on. It nevertheless, was was considered as a founding moment, as a, as a founding uh, character of the Bohemian Kingdom in itself. And this is particularly important because it, it started, in fact, from 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 that time in order to stress the royal prerogatives. The other very important figure that we we named also before is naturally Stephen uh, Stephen the first, known as the saint, in fact, of King of Hungary. Um, in Hungarian, it's it, it's I think it's called as, as known as Saint or Saint uh, Istvan. And um, he was son of he he was born in uh, around 975 and died in 1038. He was son of the prince uh, Jedza, um, and he um, he was baptized uh, when he was still a when when he was still a child. Um, this is not to be given for granted because at this time baptism was still a very um, political thing. It was not entered into into the local practice it was a, a very important in fact royal policy at this time to 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 essentially show from which side uh, the the in, in the also in international politics the 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 dynasty sided fundamentally and um and in fact he was known he he was born actually as Vaik uh, if i pronounce it correctly it's, it's spelled V A um, J K um, to assume the one of uh, of of Stephen. It was was typical that fundamentally through baptism also the, the same uh, kings who had a, in fact a, a pagan name because that was the point uh, assumed instead a a Christian name. Um, and uh, he uh, Stephen therefore became also prince of um, Hungary at the death of his father. 997 and he um, he essentially carried out the conversion to Christianity of the major people and the foundation of the Christian monarchy of Hungary as we've seen he got his crown his royal crown nonetheless by Pope Sylvester II we have uh, made several videos about the Gilbert of Aurillac and uh, on uh, on Christmas of the year 1000, the day of Christmas of the year, uh, year 1000, very importantly, together with another dignity, it was one of, uh, of of legatus of the Holy Seat, an apostle of his own people. So here you see that um, the political authority is legitimized through a Christian mission of conversion of his own people. It's particularly important. Um, Stephen founded also the Archbishopric, uh, Archbishopric of uh, Est um, Tergom, if I pronounce it correctly. It was one of the most important in, in Hungary during in, in, in Hungarian history, and um, around which the Hungarian Church was progressively structured. In fact, uh, th this had a very physical. It was a very physical thing. I mean, it, founding a bishopric was not like saying, okay, let's establish this for me. It, it really meant to found it, to to finance it for the building of the church, of its administration, and so on. So that was even actually a physical thing to, to, to even building a church at the time is uh, is an imposing, um, you know, investment. And and he was and Stephen was governing, uh, governing, governing. Sorry. On Hungary, with essentially we are iron fist, or at least I am relatively skeptical about this. I mean, there was obviously a sort of political bargaining with the nobility, but nevertheless, this had been one of the most powerful monarchs ever seen in Hungary. Actually, probably the strongest one, um, as he um, had 
fundamentally uh, an immense as asset, the so-called patrimonium regis, the the, the asset, the king's uh, property, the king's asset, that uh, derived to him from this original uh, distribution of lands that initially had naturally favored the the greater lords, the overlord in the, in the major people, and that now was being glowed now with with further with further um, legitimization um, by this uh, international choice of of Christianization that put Hungary into the orbit of the of the of the empire of the Western Empire and of the Roman Church. This was particularly important. Let's recall that uh, a, a few decades before the 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 Magyars had been finally defeated by uh, the Ottonians, and they they fundamentally stop their own um, uh, their own predatory strategy around Europe. They 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 are confined. They basically they're settled down from in the Pannonian Basin um, once for all, and they dedicate to this work of um, uh, sedentarization. Also, in fact. Um, ins getting inspired by the Western models, by the German models, the Hungers were deeply impressed by the ability the Ottonians had. To, I mean, by the, the defeats they had, they had suffered at the hands of the Ottonians, and they kind of recognized themselves as part of that. Uh, you know, as not as subjects of the empire, because Hungary never was part of the Holy Roman Empire, unlike Bohemia. But um, Still, kind of more leaning from that di from that side, from that direction, than on the Byzantine one, because Hungary, objectively, you know, just finishing fundamentally at the, the Danube, um, was bordering the Byzantine Empire, and also the Byzantine influence had been very, very important. So, also the Ottonian victory over the Hungars uh, was a, a great international victory, because after this, the the Magyars uh, decide to to enter the the German orbit, not the Byzantine one but also in material culture and in general in political uh, ties and so on the, the Hungarian-Byzantine relations remain pretty intense throughout the following centuries um, and there is a, a great uh, great influence also in the especially in material culture but uh, you know the, the Hungarians you know that Constantinople had always to fight against whoever had settled in Bannonian on the Pannonian Basin. Uh, the Hungarians never arrived like the others to, to besiege Constantinople, if I'm not wrong, but it, it, it's... Um, uh, no, it, it never happened. But it... Um, they were still kind of a important power. During the 12th century also there is this massive Byzantine expansion once again um, in the Balkans, along the Danubian frontier, the, the, the Hungarians get fundamentally pressed once again. So there was always this very interesting um, uh, characteristic condition of the Hungarian kingdom that was bit in between this, the, the two empires, and also was drawing um, political and institutional models from these empires. In fact, the Kingdom of Hungary I was saying also before it, it, it resembled more like a. Uh, an empire than a kingdom. Even if we look at the titles of the Hungarian kingdom, it was uh, it's an impressive list of several territories that were annexed time after time. And objectively, from an extensional point of view, the, the Hungarian kingdom was was enormous, and it remained so in fact till the very the very end, till the eventually the the Ottoman the Ottoman conquest. And um, Stephen, however, this time. Um, was uh, was also, in fact, allied to the uh, to Basil II, to the em Byzantine Emperor, uh, and that uh, and fought against the Bulgars, the Bulgarians at this time. They had transformed also in their. We're not discussing much now about Bulgaria because I, I think I, will, I want to leave it as a chapter on its own. But now. The uh, also in here that these were the the, the, bit the neighbors of the um, 
of the Hungarians and relations were not so happy. Uh, Sivan defeated the Bulgarians in 10-3. Um, um, Sivan also intervened into the Croatian uh, affairs. Um, he occupied on behalf and supporting the, the Croatian King Krasimir III, Trau and, uh, and Split in around the, in the late 20s of the 11th century. And he also repelled one attack of the German um, Emperor Conrad in 1030. So that now the Germans, won after having defeated the they, they thought they could expand fundamentally also in tor towards the Hungarian direction to, to get a, a, a more substantial submission, but um, the, the attack is repelled. Um, and um, also, um, Stephen's son Emmerich was, uh, was made saint, and uh, he died uh, previously, uh, before his father in 1031, and therefore, Sivan, after his sons that nominated as successor his um, the um, as cap of, of supreme uh, captain of the Magyar army, the nephew Peter Orsalus, that was son of the uh, uh, Venetian. Uh, Doge Otto, and eventually he was canonized in 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 um, after his death, fif less than fifty years after his death in ten eighty three, nonetheless, but by Gregory the Seventh, and um, and I think that uh, also this is a uh, national holiday in, in Hungary. So also in here a very important character uh, that defined uh, the. The, the the construction of the kingdom of Hungary as a Christian kingdom as a as a unique entity also also in here the main problem had been the, the local aristocracy that ha was instead trying to maintain its own prerogatives uh, against the monarchy um, so this this print of sacralization was acquired um, by the sovereigns so it greatly contributed to legitimize their roles internationally speaking uh, as we have seen there was a very strong international meaning <laughs> in this uh, evangelization for Hungary especially it was not so obvious that they would convert to Roman Catholicism they would they could I mean to the Roman the Roman Church better because at this time the schism didn't quite happen, but naturally they were still kind of two separated things. Uh, excuse me, I take off my shirt because it's terribly hot. Here we go. I hate heat in an incredible way. Um, the um, <coughs> And there is also another uh, very important um, nature of this sacralization is that doesn't have to be interpreted just from you know a formal point of view, just at a high institutional level that was meant to play um, with the other nations to be accepted as a fellow Christian country and so on in the in the political sphere. Um, it was very important also for the local population because these saints had also often a military character. Um, you know that warrior saints uh, were very important in, in medieval times, in general, and that uh, these were protectors of uh, during wars, etc. All the Christian armies invoked God, uh, Mary, etc. There was a very, a very deep. Um, spiritual connection between every political and military action and Christianity. In the case of these um, formerly pagan countries, the the figure of these the figures of these kings acquire a a very um, hybrid meaning, especially when you consider it from the from the 
perspective of the local population because the local population was fundamentally still um, pagan in mindset. I mean, they could even get Christianized formally. Normally, Christianization started from the elites and then went down to the common people. So usually, it's not that these people all of a sudden Christianized and they stopped believing what they believed. They they still were were pushed by a very strong particularly military ethos, because fundamentally pagan societies had been all about war, um, ideally in the sense that they, um, they, they didn't see anything really wrong in killing and slaughtering and shedding blood. Now, naturally Christianity brought in a, a very different religious sensitivity that however didn't at all erase the military nature of these countries. Um, in, the ca in the sense of, hung of Hungary, it's all very, you know, Biblical, you know that th there are there is this the idea that before the hungers were these ter terrible raiders and pillagers and so on, and they get defeated by the hand of, of God that passes through the sword of the Holy Roman Emperor, and they uh, and and these figures of saints redeem fundamentally the world nation because as kings they they are chosen by God to 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 guide. The evangelization of, of the people and so on. But these are also military saints. I mean, in the case of uh, St Stephen of Hungary, this is particularly evident. And, and this, um, you know, the sanctification, even from a Christian point of view, was seen still by the local people, by the subject, as a sanctification also for its military deeds. I mean, these people, in their pagan mindset, uh, thought that this guy was holy now, because he was also wa he was chiefly a warrior, that's how it had been built. The, the, the whole thing had been ideologically built because it's very difficult to acquaint someone with military, excuse me, with a, with a Christian ethics. Um, you know, all of the sudden you need this um, moment of to which you give to the people what wh what he wants to believe, and the. Um, the sanctification now was also something very new compared to the pagan tradition. The pagan tradition had generally avoided to sanctify monarchs because this was incompatible with that eg egalitarianism that we have seen before and that was anti-democratic in this sense. So certain kings back in the day had tried, even in the Germanic world, to say, okay, I'm holy because my dynasty, I don't know, descends from some sort of god or... or or uh, you know, uh, um, 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 I don't know how how to call it. Um, whatever it's a certain kind of magical figure, um, so so a human figure, etc. Um, in the pagan and 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 the people that said, "Now nah, we don't believe you because you know you want we well, want to do that just to acquire power that is not given to you by society because at that time." also paganism, was mostly about the right, and the right was meant to check the political power. That's how it was, really. So, in, in here, what you find in this, um, stre in, in stressing the, also the military character of certain um, kings, saints, is definitely the legacy, the pagan legacy that wanted uh, the... Uh, these leaders as, you know, invested by a kind of, a, mostly a military duty, a military role in front of the eyes of the society. But at the same time you find the fact that this is now a saint, that this is, uh, this is something more than the just the, the prince that is elected by the assembly of the freemen that is meant to just to fight the enemy and then comes back to be a normal freeman. This is something more. And, and therefore this reflects the transformation that finally was occurring into in this case into the major society that passed through in fact sedentarization, the defeat at the hands of the the Ottonians, and this progressive exposure to Christianity that had over the generations in fact changed society. Also naturally the the, the blending with the the rest of the, the population because the hungers that were uh, as all these steps peoples that came from, from, from Asia were were a minority compared to the, the 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 local population, and they ended up to 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 be absorbed by it fundamentally. So these transformations are very important because they happen at so many levels, not just 
in terms of um, the the construction of a monarchy, but uh, in also at its social base, you know, because otherwise that monarchy could have not been built. It, it would have remained simply a bunch of clans, etc. Instead, this progressive and this went along in part with also with the needs of the aristocracy because the aristocracy was doing a bit the same on its own. Also, the aristocracy at this point was seeing into the royal model something to imitate, like founding monasteries, founding churches, um, assuming this also, uh, you know, political and military authority. Why? Because now the the major horsemen of the steppes had been sanitarized; they had been turned in, into peasants. The, the the society had changed. Not all of them, not all the freemen fought. Most of them just was just working the land. Um, and, and therefore, also the social roles were getting defined in a different fashion. And uh, it's also very important that these peoples were kind of stopped in in their expansionism. Um, there is naturally a, a physiological transformation that happens with every single people who sanitarizes. It had happened with the Germans, and then it happened for the steppes populations. Everyone, every time you sanitarize, there is a very a brutal change in your social structure, in your culture, in everything. But at the same time, it's still meaningful that the Christianization of these kingdoms passes through sometimes. I mean, in the case, let's talk about the case of Hungary, because for the others it was different. But not so much, because also the, the I mean, also the Czechs and the Sorbs and the Poles had been fighting, I don't know, with, 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 the, with the Germans. And they generally got they, they were generally weaker because the the they were kind of still sort of tribes or you know conglomerations that you know while Germany we all you know its division was still something more structured on a Frankish model with you know castles with lands with the military elite and so on so um, so the the idea however is important is that. Christianization passes also through the normalization of the... Uh, it, it's a bit of an osmotic process, right? These peoples were warlike, were pagan, we were kind of tr troubled in many ways. They didn't have a unique guide. They were difficult in this sense even to control. Given a single... Uh, leader legitimizing even from the external single leader means that you can't control that that the whole people, the whole set of clans, by controlling one leader. This is very important. This is how essentially client states are built. Why is that? You know, the popes and the emperors now were going to to legitimize these Christian monarchies for for no reason because they had nothing to do. Of course, they had an interest also to frame now these countries in, in in the Christian system to make them more acceptable, less warlike, to stabilize the area, to consolidate the, uh, you know, to, to ex expand their um, control over those areas to, to take them away from the Byzantines and other things. So there are also very, very, always very practical very practical needs. But there is also at the same time, this is what I wanted to stress, a sort of traditional folklore that wants to see in, in these monarchs, not just Christians, but also the ancient pagan warlords. This is particularly important because Christianization was de facto very superficial, at least the, be the beginning still. So it was accepted. There are different ways, for instance, uh, that emerge from the sources in the way these sovereigns now presented themselves internationally to authorities like the emperor, like the pope, and 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 the the way they presented themselves to their own subjects. So it's striking that you know the, the different register, the different lexicon, the different uh, rhetoric that, that existed between these two in uh, these two directions. Because internationally you're just a good, uh, pious Christian ruler, uh, etc. It works for peace, uh, for for conquered, etc. At the eyes of the subjects, this guy was still the overlord. 
was still the tribal leader, was still the one who bore arms and that used them to, to expand, to, to conquer, the glory and all this stuff. Naturally, also both things got compenetrated, uh, were compenetrated, so, so it's never, you know, th there is an influx between the two things and eventually over the centuries a sort of overlapping because now in fact society could allow this, but the military character is never to be forgotten, even in you know, in the late Middle Ages, even beyond, because these monarchies were chosen to, however, bear arms in a way or another to defend their people. Now, even as Christian rulers, these kings had to defend the uh, societas Christiana, the, the Christian society, the, uh, the with arms against the pagans, against the infidels, against the the enemies of the faith, more in general. And um, I would, um, so, looking at the growing political weight of aristocracy in Poland, Bohemia, and Hungary. So, in the relation between the kings and the other political uh, actors, fundamentally, there are, um, as we've seen, several differences that exist between the Western kingdoms and the Eastern ones. Um, at, at least, uh, especially for these mo more important monarchies of Eastern Europe that we just named. Um, we're, we have already observed how the Slavic countries were, uh, for, uh, you know, for the most characterized by a, sur a relatively scarce social articulation. Mm -hmm. There are several distinctions you can make logically, but as we stated, the urban centers didn't have overall a great political weight, while it was aristocracy to be the um, the principal interlocutor of the sovereign. This is particularly important mm -hmm. because you couldn't avoid at that point to to take the aristocracy into consideration in in the internal political balance of the king. So differently for, for what was happening, for example, in France or in England the relation between the monarchy and the nobility was, however, not such to favor the consolidation of, s of certain statal structures. We have seen it at the beginning of the video, during the introduction. We observed how feudalism in the West was already developed in such a form that, in spite of resources were still very powerful, they however, had managed to build, they were so powerful, in fact, they had been managed to to back the construction of a more solid institution. Doesn't matter how decentralized this was. I mean, France and England were different, at least initially, from, from this. France had a very weak central power at the beginning. England, instead, was born like a place was was strongly centralized for, for that time, by, uh, you know, after the Norman conquest then things get kind of be balanced up because it's relative uh, but uh, rather France that eventually expands and so on but um, so it, we can say that in Eastern Europe the, the, the local aristocracies had also in here less um, were, were more imposant on the monarchy but also they had less means on their own to build something more structural consistent this is particularly important. Um, in spite of this um, unbalance, mm -hmm. so in spite of this, the uh, the power that the aristocracy had, and the uh, all com compared to the crown, thanks to the formal representants, it was granted to the various social stands or states, however you want to call it, especially during the 14th century, in Poland, Bohemia and Hungary, there was, um, the monarchs managed to maintain a certain balance between, in the relation between the crown and the other political forces. There were these diets, these um, assemblies were um, next to the uh, nobility was sitting also the um, the newborn uh, 
bourgeoisie, we can't call it very anachronistically, but, you know, this kind of middle classes, this sense of, of, of normally, of, in fact, of commoners, but were involved into trade, into tra international, into finance, and stuff like that. And um, the diet um, could exercise a sort of veto right um, towards some of some of the royal um, dispositions. Uh, the measures and uh, sorry, I can't find the. Yeah, measures, provisions, and and chiefly this was um, the, the the problem around which the whole political debate gravitated were these um, extraordinary tax impositions. That was the real matter. Uh, normally, uh, kingdoms had this uh, normal taxes, tolls, and so on that granted a a very modest income to the crown that was most of the times, in fact, not at all uh, satisfactory in order to carry out certain policies, chiefly war, that was being, that was kind of the, the first and the most important activity uh, at the time, also the most demanding. So, um, but the, the same sovereigns couldn't um, um, uh, had their own means to stem fundamentally the um, centrifugal tendencies um, expressed chiefly by the nobility um, at the benefit of the statal uh, cohesion. This could be done, in fact, by playing between this. Um, playing on these various stands, saying, okay, now I favor cities, I favor this city against them s certain rights of mint, of trade, of, uh, of exacting tolls, so that I personally, as a king, don't objectively get much from it. Yeah, okay, the, the city might grow and they, pay, they, might start, they may start paying me more because the economy gets kind of revived, but at the same time, that same city will become greedy and, and will not want to, to pay uh, money <laughs> to me anymore. But at the same time, the, the, the main result was to balance um, the power of the local nobility. Because if you have a city that expands into a certain area that is usually dominated by a noble, well, that noble now will have some problems in managing this community. Because maybe this community was formerly subjected to him, now the, the king grants certain rights to this community, this co community grows and starts resist the, uh, the the nobility. So the nobility at that point has less energies to commit to uh, to empower itself and to eventually go against the, the, the crowd. This city also has now these rights that are fundamentally legitimized together with the monarchy because it was a monarch who granted it so uh, there was no reason for this city to go against the same monarch who le had legitimized these rights because they, they they might have first of all lost them but secondly they uh, they they had a greater interest in legitimizing that authority so that it could keep backing it and um, and uh, as a leg legitimizing force. Excuse me, I drink a little. The same went on for the nobility, telling the truth, because also the nobility received favors from the crown and all this stuff. So the real political art was to perfectly counterbalance all these powers to make the monarchy kind of slowly advancing in turn. Now, it was very complicated. There was a lot of uh, political equilibrism entailed, as you understand. And um, the looking at the events of this of these countries that are kind of in interesting, 
respectively Bohemia, Hungary and Poland. Now, um, very briefly, uh, Bohemia under Boleslav the, the first ruled uh, between 929 and 967 um, became fundamentally this is important as perspective the most important country in Central Europe um, it, it extended its power over Moravia in part and on part of Silesia, Silesia and Slovakia and so it uh, had this moment of consistent expansion that kind of um, controlled under Ionic authority the various Slavic um, populations that dwelled in these territories. Vladislav II eventually in the 12th century um, uh, ruling from 1140 to 1173 got his royal crown within the empire but by uh, F Frederick Barbarossa in, in 1158 um, and um, I think that I'm not entirely sure whether the, the crown was eventually maintained um, all the time but it was uh, surely recovered and this is I should have checked this before I think that the Bohemian kings yeah the, the the kingdom of Bohemia was recognized in 1158 but eventually not all the sovereigns uh, got the the crown from 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 the emperor fundamentally because that was also the main well, main uh, preconditions they were now vassals of the empire so it, it depended on the emperor whether you got the, the crown or not and surely, however, the crown was reacquired by Ottokar the First, Premislid, in, in ruled between 1197 and 1230, and uh, which, in fact, now had it confirmed also for his successors, regulating the relations between Bohemia and the empire through the, the Golden Bowl of Sicily that was um, granted this time by uh, Frederick the Second of Swabia, in fact, from from in twelve twelve. So at this point, the Premislets really worked hard to consolidate a state. It was kind of the acme of of, of the um, of the Premislet dynasty um, because it um, the the crown began to expand, especially after the the collapse of the Orange-Staufen dynasty in the empire, that a lot of room, the, the, the most consistent political entity was definitely Bohemia, which is very interesting and it shows you how, you know, this initial ability of centralizing in, 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 in this Eastern monarchies had been functioning rather well, especially in Bohemia. Now, the, the, the most structured domain that existed in the whole empire was fundamentally not a German one, but a Slavic one. And especially under Ottokar II, Permislit ruled between 1253 and 1278 until his death on the battlefield of Markfeld, um, the Permislits managed uh, to um, reunite under their uh, domain to, to Bohemia, um, Lower Austria, also parts of High Austria, if I'm not wrong, Styria, Carinthia, uh, 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 also, the fundamentally the the, the Slavic um, Slovenia fundamentally, and the um, and also expanding partly in, uh, in in Silesia, or at least extending its control on on, on this area that um, was also. Um, particularly important because it was this area of frontier fundamentally between Germany, Poland and and, and Bohemia and uh, it was originally a Slavic uh, region, it eventually was very very heavily Germanized as we know so um, Silesia had been part of the uh, of the PS domains by the way so there is also a very strong bond that exists between the Promislets and the PS, there were they were 
uh, inter they intermarried. Also, the same Ottokar the Second, just like other Bohemian kings, went um, to fight into the Baltic Crusades together with the Germans and the Poles. Um, Königsberg w was founded, in fact, in honor of the same Ottokar the Second. So, on, on Ottokar the Second, especially, Bohemia extends o over, I mean, not Bohemia probably, but the Permisled uh, rule extends over all over this land. So it, w it was carried out, as always, through also marriage ties and um, also this uh, extinction of, of local, um, especially the, the, the Babenberg dynasty in Austria. Um, they were also always at war with Hungary as well, because they, they naturally the Hungarians were looking at Austria as well now. Um, so it was very complicated. Eventually, the wall system, the Ottokar II built, collapses with his um, defeat at the hands of Rudolf of Habsburg, first in 1276, then 1278, where he, uh, the same Ottokar, is killed. So Bohemia gets, r uh, the, the Premier power gets resized to Bohemia. And so, uh, at this point, under Ottokar II, we, we saw uh, it before, the, the cities had, in Bohemia, had developed consistently. The uh, Ottokar has founded, if I'm not wrong, also the famous city of Cheske uh, Budajovice. I don't know whether that's, this is the actual pronunciation. So the, all the aim was to counter the nobility. The same Ottokar had actually ris been risen um, to power um, against his father by the same nobility. So he knew perfectly how that uh, the aristocrats worked and was horrified by it, especially when he became king himself. And um, this brought to this politics that tried to to alienate fundamentally the, the nobility from the affairs, especially uh, there was the the this, this other dynasties, especially Moravia, that were um, were Bohemia was relatively um, were relatively well organized, but uh, Moravia was um, at this point also pretty. Uh, autonomous in, in its uh, ambitions as well, also as well. So they, um, this is interesting because it shows you that even when we're talking about compact domains, even at a local level, there were still very sensitive differences that were um, regarded as. Um, uh, um, I mean, sensible differences that that could undermine even the local power. Moravia was kind of a problem uh, problem in the um, in the Bohemian case because it always tried to, to autonomize itself so it even got allied with, with the Habsburgs and so on. So the um, the um, so the successor of Autogar II Vent, uh, Venceslas uh, the second, the rule between 1278 and 1305, also became king of Poland in the year 1300. At this time, by the way, also the the Abs even the Habsburgs managed, after the Battle of Merkfeld, to extend their uh, kingship over um, both over Bohemia and Poland, at least nominally, because this is also part of the reason why there were lots of enemies now of the Habsburgs. But that's in part also after the extension of the Parmes, that's why the Luxembourgs were called into um, into into action. What I wanted to call in, uh, to look in here is what was the, the name of the, because I know the, in German the Rosenberg family, that was however the I don't remember the, the Bohemian name I remember all these things by heart um, when I was writing my master thesis on Berlv. But now I don't remember the Slavic name of the eventually the German um, name of the. I might search it. Wh well, whatever. However, this is particularly important because it gives you the dimension of the overall. Um, the fluidity of this system, how 
this domains could be built but fundamentally could collapse in a very short time how this was happening in a certain sense over you know beyond the local power I mean definitely uh, the, the local power um, had uh, the, the local resources were fundamental in order to um, to maintain control over the um, to, to draw the resources from fundamentally but the main expansion that this um, that could be achieved was exploiting this sovereign national let's say national is uh, anachronistic but the sovereign country I don't know how to define it differently um, powers whatever I can't find that name what the hell where there was a name that uh, of the, the Slavic name of the ancient Moravian family of the Rosenberg um, and uh, you will tell me um, and um, at this point um, the the Promislets also so that so they n namely become kings of Poland as well the Arpads of Hungary the dynasty of Stephen uh, still was ruling on Hungary um, Went extinguished. By the way, this is also another con constant in Eastern European kingdoms. There were there were these great, ancient, kind of even mythical, uh, in it, their origins dynasties: the Promyslets in Bohemia, the Piast in Poland, the Arpads in Hungary. That all stemmed, in a certain sense, from the same uh, origins in, in terms of uh, political and, and institutional construction of their kingdoms and that rule for centuries they are very long living uh, dynasties and, and, and at a certain time get extinguished get extinguished uh, they, and therefore the, the, uh, the struggle that they had carried out against the uh, nobility for centralizing kind of gets lost there is this moment of crisis and external foreign dynasties come to rule in these kingdoms so these are kind of very interesting common features as much as interesting as you know observing in this 13th 14th century how certain western dynasties go east to rule over these kingdoms you're talking about the Habsburgs you're talking about the well the Habsburgs yeah they kind of intervene they don't really become uh, only in the modern age they kind of acquire towards the modern age they they kind of acquired it. They, they're really their external crowns. But think about the Luxembourgs. Uh, think about the Angevins that also sees uh, both the Hungarian and the Polish throne. So that there is this um, um, kind of run um, for the East, dynastically speaking. That is a very important opportunity, and that also ties consistently the the political. Uh, history of, of, of these countries to uh, in Eastern Europe to, to the ones in the West and um, so at this point the premise let's try to unify all the three kingdoms from Bohemia they assumed the title of Polish um, kings uh, they they try also to extend their, their control over Hungary that you know Bohemians and Hungarians have all, kind of always fought oh, by the way always in the same places if you study the military history of the <laughs> of that border between Austria and Moravia um, and uh, in fact bo bo the Bohemians and Hungarians were always kind of uh, antagonists in, the, in that in, in that in that context obviously with the due exceptions because this could happen that um, I could have some some common um, aim uh, at that point, at one point or another, and um, so uh, wait a second here. Okay, sorry, technical problems. So um, the. Um, However, in 1306, Venceslas III, last of the Promislets, uh, is, um, is assassinated. And this 
uh, dream of unifying all the three kingdoms under a same dynasty kind of fails. Um, after Henry of Carinthia that ruled between 1307 to 1310, the, tr the Bohemian throne was entrusted to uh, John of Luxembourg, who ruled between uh, uh, 1310 and 1346, and but only with the um, son. Um, Charles the First, that would become fundamentally also Charles the Fourth, Emperor uh, of the Holy Roman Empire. The Bohemian State um, had this um, f stabilization in the territorial and juridical organi organization, and um, and also the. What Bohemian got in this sense a religious, uh, the ecclesiastical, an ecclesiastical autonomy, and with the Golden Bull of 1356, the uh, the Bohemian sovereigns were, uh, the Bohemian kings were granting sovereignty. They also were fundamentally recognized as electors of the empire. So this was this kind of institutional redefinition that stemmed from the fact that at the point. The Luxembourgs had become the most powerful dynasty uh, in uh, in Central Europe. So now, from Prague, they, they w was becoming also an international center of culture, of power, etc. There was a consistent uh, mm, strengthening of, of this monarchy. And. Um, Passing to now, we will go further afterwards. But passing through, because in, into the late Middle Ages later, because I have to make other general considerations. Passing to to Hungary more rapidly, um, we have seen uh, we see that at the uh, at the death of Stephen uh, the first, Hungary um, took part also in the among the various things in the clashes between the papacy and the empire. And normally, the uh, the Hungarians actually sided for, um, uh, for the papacy against the empire, for obvious reasons, since the Germans now, yeah, they uh, were the favorite Hungarian political model, but uh, actually they were always very cautious and they feared that the, the next German route of expansion would take the Danubian way and overrun Hungary. So they always tried to to keep the empire distant. It was the problem of the, the Hungarian king to to, to, to remain uh, not to remain strangled between the Holy Roman Empire and the Byzantine Empire. And seizing opportunity every opportunity accordingly. Um, so there was a sort of period of, of decadence that um, that that happened fundamentally. All of these kingdoms had these moments of being, you know, going back and forth. The main problem was, in fact, related to to royal power, uh, where did these kings were able to to where effective rulers were able to control the kingdom. To defend it, etc. There were success, uh, successory problems, uh, age minority, all of these problems. They were naturally taken, were exploited by the local nobility to try to 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 weaken royal authority. In turn, so uh, it's rare to find at this time in the, in the Middle Ages, like one one kingdom that constantly progresses, like one sovereign after the other is. Is an effective ruler. It expands. It consolidates. There are moments of distress. Can, by the way, or ruin sometimes uh, generations of, of 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 development of improvement. And that's uh, you see that in fact in several countries this this uh, the, the whole process of centralization didn't didn't work well, especially in these ones. Um, however, under Ladislas the, the first world between 1077 and 1095, there is a new uh, expansionistic phase. Um, in uh, between 1089-1090, there was the conquest of Slavonia. In 1091, there is the the 
um, the union of the Croatian crown that would last until the uh, actually the end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1918. Um, so you see that here Hungary is fundamentally um, adding all other chunks of lands around the, the Bannonian uh, basin and the, the the control of Croatia also brought now to uh, to an attempt to expand in, in the on the Adriatic Sea because Hungary fundamentally had no access to the sea so um, at this time the Adriatic was being um, uh, run let's say by by Venice that was in this phase of expansion and fundamentally the enmity between Venice and the Hungarian crown R Republic of Venice the Hungarian clown, uh, crown uh, go on for goes on for three centuries and the objective was especially the dominion of Dalmatia as you understand so this essentially the coastal um, areas of, of the the Western Balkans and that could open in fact to trade with, with the East and so on otherwise all the other routes were by, by land uh, although Hungary controlled naturally also the Danube that was quite profitable for economically speaking I think also in the sense that obviously the Danube was um, uh, an important waterway it was fo followed by Crusaders in the land route at least at the very important at the, the, the beginning the first crusade the other eventually started to take the Mediterranean that's the reason also why Hungary was interested in, in historical perspective to to expand increasingly under uh, on the sea uh, doing it on the Black Sea was too, com too complicated because Hungary formally controlled na nominally controlled certain areas of what would be today's Romania but venturing in there was a was a kind of a nightmare and uh keeping connections with the with the black sea aside from the the danubian waterway was kind of problematic and um nevertheless hungary controlled very important roads also you know along the way uh in the balkans um but um the um there is also this other, in fact, general continental dimension because the uh, the union with Croatia and the this kind of alternate p possession of Dalmatia uh, against Venice um, involved Hungary also in the strictly Balkanic problems and especially contrasting with with Constantinople and. Um, So uh, it was difficult to control the, the middle ground because the, the middle ground, the, the strictly Danubian area, was first of all in in, in countries like Serbia and other, it, it's very difficult to to get in because even at in terms of terrain and sort of environment, it's very hard. So that area had remained historically kind of an area of frontier since the migration era, since the time of the Roman Empire. So there was no real solid entity that had been built across this area so at, at that point at least especially after the crashing of the the Bulgarians at the hands of Basil II uh, kind of Hungary and, and Constantinople were um, you know kind of opposing each other in order trying to expand in this area but not really making so many you know uh, extraordinary progress and it, there were also other problems that these powers had respectively on, on their own um, on other fronts let's say but there was also pretty intense clash uh, on, on that frontier and um, at this point f um, the uh, as we've seen Hungary had adopted partly the Western feudal models the Hungarians were the ones that um, the Bohemians had settled a lot of German merc mercenaries as well into Bohemia they, they were particularly uh, close to the Germans in general they, they as we've seen they organ they, they the German politics also mainly directed the, the influence the Bohemian one massively Hungary also had settled many Western um, uh, noblemen 
he had imported feudalism with them. So uh, in the process, um, this naturally gave conferred to Hungary a certain um, institutional order, but at the same time the old patrimonial state of the crown was progressively declining, was it being exhausted, and the this forms of feudal organization similar to the West ultimately brought to the crisis of royal power in some way. In um, 1222 the Hungarian king Andrew II that ruled between 1205 to 1235 recognized to the noblemen the right to oppose to every uh, activity that of, uh, of the king that was contrary to the laws. So this is a kind of a recognition of um, very uh, great um, aristocratic interference into the royal political action and also great autonomy conse consequently. And um, there was, however, a, an attempt um, from um, uh, um, the Hungarian kings, especially in the second half of the 13th century to rebuild these, um, this monarchic power. This happened um, starting from, chiefly from the king Bela uh, de Fort that ruled between uh, 1235 to 1270. Uh, but um, this attempt was disrupted fundamentally by the great cataclysm of uh, 13th century Europe that was the Mongol invasion. Um, the Mongols invade Hungary, they defeat uh, several times the, the, the Hungarian army in, in open field. And this happened in 1241. So Hungary basically um, is thrown into chaos by a certain measure. Um, it's, it's only after Bella's successors, chiefly Stephen the fifth ruled between 1270 and 1272, and Ladislas the um, the fourth. Sorry, I, before I said Stephen the fourth was uh, king of uh, Hungary, the one that participated to Markville. No, it's Ladislas the fourth. Ladislas the fourth, the Kuman, um, that ruled between 1272 and 1290. Um, the um, the nobiliar oligarchy, however went on, it, it was uh, consolidated fundamentally. And the last of the Arpad dynasts, Andrew the Third, that ruled between 1290 to 1241, was um, was struggling um, for succession because of the Habsburgs and the uh, Anjou who were trying, the Angevins, who were trying to to, to in fact to enter the, the, the Hungarian affairs and in fact it was the Angevins that um, the uh, that eventually took over the kingdom at the uh, the death of Andrew the third Charles Robert of Anjou after certain certain dynastic clashes could uh, take the um, uh, could wear the holy crown of Hungary in 1308. So this is also a very important event in um, in European history as a whole, in, because the Angevins at this time were were really kind of the most powerful entity existing uh, in uh, in Europe. Um, we can't talk about a real hegemony, but definitely they were controlling now several countries, um, including Poland. In fact, now we pass to Poland from the origins. You know that Poland um, is um, normally uh, regarded as founded as a sort of state by Mieszko the first, died in 992. Um, from his reign, we see that there was definitely a, a rule that already, you know, was already developed in some measure. We we don't know excessively much, um, and. Um, and it's it's in here that the Piast dynasty of Poland rises, and um, the Piasts were fundamentally involved in, um, in in this attempt of expansion 
um, either contrasting the German one uh, because the Germans naturally were initially uh, also at war with Poland um, in a uh, when when it was not yet Christianized fundamentally, and um, Mieczko brings to the conversion Christian to uh, Christianism nine hundred sixty six, and um, from the other side, uh, side sorry, there is a an expansion. A Polish expansion against the same um, to the other same Slavic, Western Slavic tribes that are that were uh, settled into the wide basins of the Vistula and the other rivers uh, up to the Baltic Sea. So in 966, uh, as we've seen um, also for for Bohemia and Hungary, the conversion to Christianity brings to a deformation of a strictly Polish ecclesiastical hierarchy. So also in here Christianization brings to definition of a political authority. Um, there is the donation of, 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 um, of Poland to the Holy Seat that is carried out by Mieszko. Um, and it's um and which contributes definitely to, to tie the poles directly to the center of Christianity. Um with Mieszko's uh, son with Boleslav uh, the um that ruled between nine hundred ninety two to ten twenty five Poland began the expansion towards the east and also the clash in the West with the Emperor Henry the Second, and um, and at this time there is a first uh, very interesting uh, international um, sighting because um, the Holy Roman Empire and the Kievan Rus ally against Poland, and this is kind of a constant in Polish history that began from there. Kind of Germany and Russia uh, now with with a with a very great approximation, talking about the, the, the 11th century, kind of side to to stem the power of Poland. Um, Boleslav um, arrived to conclude the peace of Bautzen in in 1018 uh, with the empire, and he also favored the mission, the evangel, uh, the, the the evangelic mission of Saint Adalbert. Is uh, one of the uh, the great figures that is uh, Saint Albert of of Prague, by the way, that uh, has this um, enormous importance of identitarily speaking, etc. He was the second bishop of Prague at the end of the 10th century. is venerated uh, as saint by the Catholic um, Church that considers him as patron. In fact, of all this great. Um, Eastern European uh, area, both in Bohemia, in Poland, in Hungary, and even in Prussia, and um, and, and it is, he is famous also because he was famously martyrized during the conversion of the Baltic tribes of Prussia uh, to cr Christianity, and uh, it's another, it's a very important figure. Uh, we we should comment sometimes on over which we should which we should comment on on Schwerpunkt sometime but um, just for saying that there was a sort of, of common feeling I would say between these this countries in some way I mean Bohemia, Hungary and especially Bohemia and Poland were kind of close in uh, also politically speaking we're also concerned about the, the, the German expansionism in some measure they uh, they kind of had a the Slavs mostly had a kind of a lingu they felt very much their linguistical cohesion in many ways they 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 realized in spite of their internal you know differences and uh, political you know uh, belongings that, that they had some sort of common traditions uh, there are some anecdotes I would like to make but I think the video is already very long the way it is the 
the important thing here is um, however that um, the the piasts use um, the PS use these um, missionaries to reinforce fundamentally the power, uh, the construction of the church in their own domains, and they assume the role of protectors of this, these missions. Um, interestingly enough, Saint Boleslav intervened into the internal clashes of the Kievan Rus. And um, in order to, and given he, you know, the successes that he, he achieved in 1024, he also obtained the royal crown. And um, after this period, fundamentally, the Piast um, dynasty uh, kind of um, has several difficulties in managing the dual state once again. The, it, basically split into these various duchies they made up Poland and uh, Poland has several problems also to contain partly the German expansion uh, they they tried themselves to expand towards the Baltic but they kind of uh, do not have did not meet a great success with these other populations that dwelled around the sea so uh, they uh, they eventually decide to intr to give um, parts of uh, of uh, their formal dominions to the the Teutonic order that had already, by the way, uh, been asked in uh, and I think created some houses in in uh, in Hungary by you know uh, the, the the Hungarian kings had con granted this. But it, it's in Poland that famously, it's from Poland at least, that the Teutonic expansion actually uh, started from, from for real, you know, from the origins of the, just of the order as it was born in, in Palestine to defend the German pilgrims and dedicated to, order dedicated to Mary. Um, so, uh, at this point, by the way, the Teutonic Knights uh, built a a real state, as a matter of fact. I mean, the, the Teutonic uh, kingdom is um, an, a, a very efficient one that manages to, by the way, also very um, a brutal means to expand um, Christianity throughout the Baltic and to, to, to strengthen itself institutionally, politically and militarily uh, in a land that, as we have seen, in, had not I've never known th those kinds of of of, uh, of degree of centralization. Uh, here, it's more than the just the Western model. It's 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 really the fact that this was also an, a kind of an ecclesiastical um, um, order, it was a monastic order that therefore was ruled in in very different ways. That there there was a sort of an elective system. Was no uh, dynastization was a great military order that could make things work in, in a very in a much less private more you know centralized fashion. And and this and famously enough the the Teutonic order expand starts expanding also at the uh, the tradition of Poland in itself. Uh, that was fun to to whom they were for the, it was formerly a vassal. Hmm? Um, the the Teutonic Knights had received that land in Prussia by concession of the Polish kings. So, um, at the same time, this the both the contacts with the Holy Roman Empire and the Teutonic expansion brings to a sort of very heavy Germanization of the Polish uh, elite, especially in the areas of Silesia. Um, and generally speaking, the more it was in the West, the, the South East remained kind of way more, way different, much more Slavic in, in many ways. And uh, the Poles also participated to the Baltic Crusades, sometimes in, uh, were employed by the same Teutonic Knights. So it's very interesting that several Polish noblemen uh, also joined the Teutonic Knights, or obviously deriving, from, deriving benefits from it. 
Um, so it was a great participated activity, we can say. Also, Poland is invested in 1241, um, especially in the East, by the um, the, um, the, Mongo the Mongol hordes of Batu. Um, and similarly to Hungary, this brings to the uh, collapse of what the the the, the Piasts, uh, had managed to 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 build in terms of statal organization, but the Piast kept, how, nevertheless, to maintain this a uh, role of central role. Also, because by the way, uh, they had spread all over the nobility. I mean, fundamentally, everyone who ruled in Poland this time in the various duchies was was a descendant of the Piast or Piast himself. So. This there was a uh, it was a kind of, it had been kind of a gluing factor in spite of all difficulties you know, all the difficulties to keep all the duchies together and all the w fights that had had all the wars that had been fought among the one among uh, uh, among uh, within you know themselves my English sucks consistently and. A very important factor in uh, keeping the uh, dynasty standing had been the church, the ecclesiastical organization. Um, this is also not to be uh, ever forgotten, uh, how importantly um, the uh, ecclesiastical organization played in order to, in order to maintain a sort of Saddle order within these kings, kingdoms. In the 14th century, um, the prince Ladislas um, died in 1333. Managed to put a sort of end to the uh, r regional fragmentation of Poland. But uh, in 1309, uh, however, it it lost the access to the Baltic Sea with the incorporation of um, uh, through the incorporation of, of Pomerania to uh, by, by the Prussians so that was also a very heavy blow um, nevertheless the, the Piest kind of continued to progress in part especially with Kazimir III um, King of Poland also known as Casimir the Great, who ruled between 1333 and 1370, Poland acquired the physiognomy of one actually the most functional and developed states, let's say, in in in, in Central Eastern Europe, and. Um, Th there was a in in internal politics. This was this reform of administration, uh, ra uh, so, uh, liberal protection of the Jews and the peasantry. This was very important. And remember what we told before about the weak um, in Eastern Europe of the weak pr the weakness of the urban classes. Now, uh, Casimir the uh, Third um, favors and protects the Jews and the peasantry because these could um, work as a as an effective counter force to the push of the uh, um, Polish nobility the um, the peasantry in Poland always was treated terribly like the the Polish aristocrats always had an enormous uh, sense of themselves. They 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 managed to to shipwreck Poland fundamentally in, in historical perspective, and um, even more than the Jews. You know, Poland. Uh, this remember also for this the discriminations against the Jews. It's uh, fundamentally, um, you know, it's, it's complicated actually in the case of Poland because there were that we. Uh, Poland was actually remembered for one of the being one of the most tolerant states toward the Jews, but this was also, in fact, due to, to other factors now that were played, however, by the crown on, on by the crown because Jews participated since the very origins to the economical development of Poland, and uh, they were in fact very much uh, of use for for the kings to 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 get money and so on. So 
and also by the, the, the nobility. Uh, the, the ones who were really oppressed and treated like animals fundamentally were the peasants. The peasants always had a... And, and this tells you so much, because the peasantry also represented this... In, in, in Eastern Europe, this the, the, the social stand where, you know, villages, towns could, could develop from. In, in, in th this... The uh, constant expansion of aristocracy eventually choked this experience, whether if they could be de developed. Um, during Kazimir III, there was also the creation in Krakow of the first Polish university in 1364. This was also uh, another very important political move because the university, like it happened with the one of Prague, um, uh, in the 14th century, it was not just a um, a cultural center. I mean, it was a very important political um, resource, an asset, because from university, um, a very skilled personnel could be drawn for the bureaucracy, for the construction of central administration, for uh, uh, in terms of. Uh, political theory to to back uh, throughout you know legal and um, and really and theological um, means the legitimacy of the 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 monarchy so creating a university meant to also to open internationally to these new theories at this time in 14th century there is uh, you know, universal um, universalism is fading, the empire and the papacy are declining, but in this sense the monarchies are getting kind of the upper hand. There is a very consistent building of the uh, local uh, national monarchies, let's say, uh, under an uh, ideological point of view. There is this kind of proto-national um, feeling that for which um, kingdoms have a kind of a uh, you know, uh, identity on their own. They are kind of a of a unique ensemble that works with its own prerogatives, with its own customs, with its own traditions, with its own monarchy, in fact. And um, this is the great century of the the, the uh, of development of the the national monarchy. Fundamentally, already in in the the following one, you have something. That is more like a in a modern, uh, more centralizing factor. At this point, uh, during the fourteenth century, is more s mostly the the emphasis on the local um, identity. Something that before had kind of weakly existed. Before it was really a matter just of sums of social stands, of dynasties, and so on. At this point, there is also a greater attention towards the the language, towards the territory towards the idea that the land has a sort of custom that has to be um, uh, preserved also by the monarchy. So this was played actually in a way or another um, both by the monarchy and the local aristocracy. In fact, in here also talking about national, it's, it's wrong. Um, it, it was stressed, um, it was mostly the nobility who stressed its kind of proto-national identity. Because they were saying that th there were additional factors for which the local customs had to be respected by the monarch. So they basically the monarch couldn't ask more than much over the social stance. They couldn't, he wouldn't, we, which we're talking always about taxes naturally, because the only thing around which th this state was built with was the necessity of drawing taxes. You can interpret it in in this way, Wally. So if you add to the fact that obviously you don't want to pay and that you want to delegitimize the sovereign in this way, this sense that there is a sort of old tradition that is all one with language, with ethnicity, and so on, that fundamentally is at the base of, uh, of, of, um, of old traditions and so on. It can't be touched because that's how the country was born and how it remained free. This is something that uh, existed so clearly... Um, even much before, you know, even in countries where the national monarchy was kind of being born conceptually before, it's a bit like what happened with, with common law, in England. You know, the idea that from one side the king stressed the fact that his rule is was due 
was um, was legitimized by the by God, and by the fact that he was called by God to rule, and the people who said, "No, you are called to rule in the name of our common law," that is a sort of natural law that ha also has grounds in the in divine law as a natural one. Uh, but it's of the English people. Well, this starts happening similarly also in other countries because, after all, it was kind of at the base of the of all medieval um, juridical systems. It's simply that in the 14th century, this is being played on to um, in, in an identitary fashion to stress the prerogatives of the local uh, of the local communities, chiefly. The local aristocracies that now wanted to put a limit to the action of the sovereign, especially in these Eastern European countries where um, the um, now, especially the the, the foreign uh, monarchies were about to to arrive fundamentally. Um, under Casimir the Third, um, there is also a uh, expansion toward the east, the collaboration with with Lithuania against the Teutonic Order. And also a relatively uh, good uh, neighboring relations with the empire and Bohemia. So passing at the late Middle Ages proper, um, we notice that things start to change. I mean, between the uh, the 14th and 15th century, the political strength of uh, now I'm talking once again in terms of old. Bohemia, Poland, and Hungary altogether. That the 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 political force of the assemblies uh, was accentuated. So uh, and it was almost ex exclusively aristocracy now to orientate its action. So basically, at this point, the aristocracies began to take over. It doesn't matter how hard these sovereigns had tried to build something more central, more unitary. It's the great aristocrats of the land that rise to pre preeminence in different degrees, but some s tendentially in the same way in all of these three countries. Um, the prerogatives of collegial organisms were consolidated. Um, they acquired fundamentally the faculty to intervene in, in every deliberation of the sovereign. Uh, and, for instance, in the case of Bohemia, also in the election of all the royal officials. So you can understand what kind of political influence this had, and how the crown had grown relatively incapable of coping with, with this. So, um, and around the nobility, by the way, uh, there was furthermore the maturation of that sort of let's call it national conscience um, in in an identity fashion say better as we said before not really national conscience but the idea that um, I mean national is fine as you understand it in the Latin etymological sense of the name the nazio so not really nationalism as we know it in the 19th century but nation in the sense of a of a country that had Com common origins fundamentally that uh, belong to to the place where you were born. So that that was the the real thing. Um, think about I don't know the Polish nobility that by the, the 17th century at this time of great expansion uh, their prerogatives was thinking to be descendant of the Sarmatians, Sarmatism. This idea of inventing a common origin, a common even ethnic origin. It's not the same like 19th century nationalism, but it still stresses the idea of a common birth, of being part of a common stock. This is particularly meaningful, because it stresses the privileges now, that particular political entity that rules allegedly on one single people, whereas, on the contrary, um, and this is what we didn't say, it is extremely important, is that these countries were all multi-ethnical, like Bohemia, Poland, Hungary, were all they were not just of the local ethnicity. These were uh, historically all multi-ethnical. There were uh, lots of different minorities. The German minorities were very important. Um, the Jewry also was very important. But the same peoples who inhabited these lands were extremely diverse. They came from different stocks, etc. Um, 
the uh, the dynastic expansion of these monarchies encompassed peoples of different loaves, different customs, different traditions, even of, of different tongues. Um, what is interesting, in my opinion, in the history of Eastern Europe is that there's never been an actual frontier among these peoples, and that there is always a very intense blending between all of this, and it gave birth to a kind of a unique identity. Now, after the 20th century, we have, with genocide, ethnic cleansing, the Holocaust, and all this stuff, you have now countries that are kind of a mono, um, mono-ethnical. Like, take Poland. Before before the, the last war, there were something like three um, and a half million Jews. Now, I think the Jews in Poland are like 30,000. So, that you can understand how the, the... But this is valid also for the German minorities, etc. So, it, it, it's... Today we see an, a very different thing from it when it was before. At this time, as we've seen also for the local monarchies, it was a, a richness to have several communities at once. The the uh, the settlement of foreigners was was encouraged by the crown because this brought to the um, the pos- to the possibility of um, fundamentally of playing on all of these communities to create a sort of equilibrium for which none of of them would, would survive chiefly to to stem to stem the nobility and and to draw also different personnel from this no um, from 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 the organization of the state in economical and bureaucratic and military military terms and um <coughs> sorry and the um, um so it was extremely varied and especially uh, for economical dynamism you know the german merchants the jews were crucial for the economy of these kingdoms we have seen how the, they these kingdoms lacked a very active and competitive um urban centers compared to the western Europe. so what's the best but to basically settle um, foreign merchants that can open to this um, to these markets that can be you know can enrich the country can make more economic harm. so this is also in part why the you know this proto-national identity and xenophobia from the side of aristocracy was developed largely because just imagine it you know you're uh you know you don't have to justify it but think it politically you know you you are a an arist- uh, a polish aristocrat you have your own land you have your own name you have your own uh, origins you have your own uh, uh, your power fundamentally um you don't want to be subjected to anyone you're free. You're traditionally like that. You think that your Slavic origin makes you like a freeman that is never is a true warrior that does never to to bow to anyone, uh, and so on. You don't want the king to ask more money that you have. So this king starts to be foreigner because you elected it, by the way. So to avoid that one of the other noblemen who is well rooted in the land can can arrive to the top and expand also on the base of his own property. Um, there are so many other um, this this uh, f- this ruler obviously has some uh, political uh, uh, foreign political connections. Uh, it favors the the settlement of uh, of foreigners. It it also draws his political power from institutional juridical and um, other, um, generally speaking, political practices that um, derive from, from, the, from, from the West, from, from lands that have nothing to do to you, with you, traditionally speaking, or at least not m- more than much. Um, he maybe also uses foreign mercenaries, because this is also what started happening. The aristocracy didn't really like to go fight for the sovereign. They constantly fought against each other. They all had their, their private armies. They they did whatever they wanted, so they spent all the money, but for that, but only for their own interest, and not to serve the king. 
for which they were always reluctant. And by the way, the king at this point, theoretically in feudal law, um, as a vassal, you had to participate to the army, the king, to the royal army, uh, because it was the 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 traditional duty owed to the to the uh, you know to to the king, and more generally, you know, a sort of continuation of the ancient tribal levy for which every freeman had to participate. Now the king literally paid the noblemen. So the king started saying, "What? What? Why do you have to pay?" for my vassals to come to war and therefore draw taxes for my own country to give this money to fundamentally someone who is pushing against me asking taxes to them because they are actually the same people. I hire mercenaries and at this time, especially in the low middle ages, you know, the, the market of, of war was pretty florid and pretty international especially, so why not increasing this? Think also of modernization. The problem that is posed now in late Middle Ages into building uh, artillery, for instance, that costs a, a, a freaking heck of money, and you need necessarily cert, uh, a bureaucratic apparatus, a sort of organization in order to field such such weapons that are also the ones that the king can incidentally use against all the fortresses of the noblemen, and now also in terms of military engineering, you cannot withstand pretty much the fa firearms. So. These are all factors that in these countries bring to the uh, increasing, and not just in them, but the, the, for the reasons that we are trying to explain today, especially in them, this growing, um, you know, separation between the monarchy and the the aristocracy. I mean, this increasing, not necessarily a separation, because now the aristocracy could also use its power to control the monarchy in some way, but this increasing cultural difference. Especially, this is particularly evident in the modern age. You know that all these foreign sovereigns normally created uh, military bodies of the, in the royal army with, that were f of foreigners or that were imitating foreign armies and stuff like that. The, this idea of uh, this xenophobia that, that, that grows fundamentally as a characteristics of these nobilities is rooted in th to this fundamentally. It's not because they had reasons to like or dislike foreigners by their own taste. It's simply that it was a political direction. It was saying we have to stress our own kind of national identity in order to preserve our prerogatives as noblemen. This was the, the end. Of it. So this is how also the mytho mythology of, of, of the common origins was stressed. Whereas, you know, these countries, originally speaking, had been very mixed, also culturally, ethno-linguistically. So this is important to stress, because it's mostly a political evidence. So even in here, the formation of a national monarchy has to be understood under this point of view, not really under the vague idea of the, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know, these people were just nationalists. This is completely anachronistic, doesn't make any freaking sense. So, in short, um, the uh, crown that was often at appanage of foreign houses, as we've seen, could even be felt as extraneous to the cultural tradition of the country. Mm? So, so, if, um, for instance, in England and in France, the aristocracy participated to a sort of uh, administrative uh, structure that control was controlled by the kings. So, essentially, the, the vassals came to work increasingly on behalf of the sovereigns. In the uh, European, Eastern European states, especially in Poland and in Hungary, the royal sovereignty could never actually fully uh, consolidate, affirm itself. In the 15th century. In here, um, the uh, seigneurial power fundamentally prevailed. So instead, uh, the, the 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 territorial government, so essentially the imposition of the saddle taxes and the uh, administration of justice, was in the hand of the. Um, of the nobility. 
in certain royal officials, as well as uh, the military was chiefly mobilitated. Um, the, the armies were chiefly mobilitated and under the control of the uh, of the nobility. And um, we can briefly observe the events of these various uh, entities, starting with Bohemia. Uh, you know that uh, we can. Where we, did we stop? Well, uh, that this kind of a golden age of the Luxembourgs, that the, the, the Dries, uh, fundamentally also here, very important topic that I never discussed, the religious reform, the action of religious reform, it was also went hand in hand with a, a political, um, you know, uh, uh, action fundamentally, uh, of Jan Hus um, brought to the um, to the birth of a, I would say, strong um, national, Bohemian national conscience. E even if, e e with all the limitations, with all the definitions that we gave, there is this very strong sentiment for which the uh, the, the cultural opposition, the cultural and political opposition to the Czech element, to the to the foreign one, it's truthfully to the German one, opened the way to this uh, ruinous who seat wars. And naturally, were not dictated by this enmity, but they brought to this um, feeling to be perceived. Also, the the history of the Bohemian nation in in, in the early uh, in the early modern age is fundamentally this you know this idea of being a a crown eventually lost its own. Um, let's say it, it was controlled fundamentally by external uh, dynasties that tried, in fact, to to act with the with the local stands, with the local classes, um, in a uh, in a way that eventually uh, ship, uh, kind of declined as um, the um, uh, excuse me that uh, eventually failed, uh, bringing to to the Thirty Years' War. By the way, so um, all. Um, dynamics that you cannot interpret through the um, the the uh, you know the, the 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 birth of a national identity that wanted just to be alone, left alone, no control. No, because the kind of the the the, the medieval mindset for which every people was under the control of a given sovereign that fundamentally had negotiated the conditions of the rule was still pretty much alive, but at the same time it was felt, chiefly by this aristocracy, that the local customs, the local, had to be had to be fundamentally preserved, because it was an economical interest, that was the reason it was not, I, uh, it, it was built also ideologically speaking, and but it was very elitary at this point, it was considered in a I mean the peasantry, arguably uh, you know, rebelled in, in in because in fact it was brought to the the, the conditions of doing it. But this general feeling that remained in there was chiefly built by the elites in order to um, to stress its own prerogatives. So, however, the uh, Hussite Wars uh, fought between 1419 and 1436 between the Bohemians, guided by Jan Szyszka, I believe that's the correct pronunciation, Prokop Holy and the uh, Emperor Sigismund, was at the time also incidentally King of Hungary, uh, brought this great um, you know, upheaval that um, is very interesting. We will have still to talk about the Hussite uh, wars uh, on Schwerpunkt. They were also very important from, um, from a military point of view, the fam famous wagon fortresses that the Hussites used um, against the, 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 feudal, the heavy feudal cavalry uh, of the Emperor. Uh, managing to de to defeat them also in very in great inferi inf numerical inferiority uh, also tranks to reuse of firearms were a bit of a unicum in in um, in in, uh, in this period they are partly co motivated by the same Hungarians on the on the Ottoman front when they fought against the Ottomans but they also naturally military technology was evolving also towards more effective directions but it's nevertheless very very important 
and this phase of conflict now we're we're gonna we're going very very quickly because we don't have time but the um this co series of conflicts was mm, concluded fundamentally by the uh, compactata or articles of praga the, through which the bohemians were readmitted within the catholic church you know that fundamentally the uh, Hussites had been in part moved by the, the so-called ultraquism, so the possibility of uh, the claim of being confa uh, of being uh, of being communicated uh, uh, through uh, both the species of uh, both bread and wine. Uh, ultraquist means but it comes from both fun fundamentally. The bothists would, would would mean so. This had posed them um, the this great movement of the. Who see it revolt into a very complex and delicate um, situation, but because it involved, in fact, this kind of, in part, uh, although in very com very um, complex fashions, this sort of kind of proto-national identity, a uh, religious contestation, political interests. So, uh, in fact, in fact, it's also relatively uh, I mean, difficult to to define it correctly. Um, nevertheless, uh, since we're speeding up. Um, George of uh, Podebrady, also a, I hope to pronounce him correctly, um, who ruled from 1457 to 1471, had the task to re uh, to reassess the to re put the the, the country in shape. Uh, although he didn't manage to reconcile fully uh, Bohemia with Rome, nor to make it this great pole of I don't know uh, European. Sovereign national mm, reorganization from a political religious point of view. Um, George was uh, followed on the throne by Ladislas the Fourth uh, Jagello or Jagello, I don't know how you you pronounce it. Uh, we ruled between 1471 to 1516 and tried to uh, reinforce uh, Catholicism in Bohemia. And uh, and eventually his son Louis uh, will rule between. 1516 and 1526. Well, incidentally, was was killed uh, at the Battle of Moax or Moach. I don't know how you pronounce it. Fighting against the Turks. It is disaster that would, uh, in fact, mark also uh, the the end of Hungary. Uh, and um, but also also with Hungary, we will stop at this now. Also for uh, with Bohemia, we stop at this. In you know that fundamentally, with Bohemia, leave, Bohemia leaves on with. Uh, in 1526, Ferdinand of Austria, brother of Charles I, uh, uh, raises to, to the throne. So that's the, the Habsburg period, and but we are in the modern age, and we conclude this, and we pass to 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 Hungary. In fact, and we um, we observe these last centuries of the Middle Ages, from this point of view. Uh, you understand, it's it's a moment of also with Bohemia, we have seen it of of turmoil. Of difficult political equilibrium, of difficulties in actually managing to to put a uh, to 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 re uh, ground in a way a, a direct control on the kingdom that could come from a local from a uh, there are external dynasties fundamentally. So this is uh, the characteristics we have traced before. For Hungary, uh, the uh, where, where did we stop? So basically, we, with the Angevins, we had stopped to the Angevins. The Angevins uh, take the Holy Crown of Hungary, and the Angevins managed to reshape, in a certain sense, the uh, the royal power in Hungary, uh, the politics of um, the new dynasty. Um, is fundamentally. Um, Pretty clear, also in the international scenario. Fundamentally, the, the, it's an anti-imperial one. The Angevins were uh, adverse to to the empire, and now was kind of disgregating. And Bohemia and Poland back Hungary, under his point of view. <coughs> Sorry. And um, the um, and and the Angevins in in Hungary um, have chiefly two aims: one in the Balkans, one in Italy. Because these were two lands where the the Angevin dynasty had expanded in the previous centuries, uh, in, uh, in in the Balkans with the uh, you know with the you know the, the collapse of the Byzantine Empire after Fourth Crusade, what the, the French had consistently 
seized, especially the internet territories now, the Angevins, but especially from Italy with Naples, and that had become this great fertile base um, against the uh, against the the uh, I mean towards the Mediterranean and with the uh, aim to to reconquer to conquer Constantinople finally once again because it now it had come back in the hands of the Byzantines and this brought to the creation of a uh, series of territorial possessions of alliances or uh, also feudal dependence dependencies um, as a guarantee of its own territory this also took place within within uh, all the world central eastern Europe because it encompassed also Poland we will see it uh, etc so this was ha actually a very wide range of action mm, that still functioned on the local dynamics that we've seen before so it, it it's a sought for extensional expansion mm, over all these amounts of lands and the um, eventually Hungary however the the Angevins lasted only up to a certain time the um, eventually it was the Luxembourgs rose to the throne and um, Hungary was increasingly put under pressure under the uh, by the Ottoman advance um, they were actually after the Byzantine Empire the first major power uh, to 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 have to deal with them uh, who also tried to, to lead the crusade was logistically strategically closer uh, to the theater of operations and um, against the Turkish threat, uh, the Emperor Sigismund of Luxembourg, we already met before, ruling from 1387 to 1437, with the help, uh, with the help of Pope Boniface the Ninth, um, uh, called up for the Crusade. So it, it 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 gathered the arms of Christianity, that however were soundly defeated at a famously um, at, at the Battle of Nicopolis in 1396. And uh, nor at this time, uh, Albert of Habsburg, ruling for 1437 to 1439, uh, managed to uh, to to prevent the Turks from conquering Bosnia. So here, the Turks are really sweeping pretty hard into the Balkans, even if Constantinople has not already fallen. And it's actually they are actually surrounding Constantinople. So next step, it's the fall of Constantinople, and there Hungary is on the first line. So the Hungarian nobility now called to the throne uh, the Polish king Ladislas III Jagello, or Jagello, ruled in Hungary between 1440, uh, 1440 and 1444, which instead was also here famously defeated and uh, killed at Varna, this other major crusader expedition mounted up by Christianity, um, uh, by Western Christianity at that point. Um, against the the Ottoman threat, I made a video. Uh, you can Google it. Uh, excuse me. You can yeah. If you search in the Ottoman um, history playlist, I inserted it. It talks both about Nicopolis and Bar Varna in a bit more of a in detail uh, about especially the international politics from from the Western perspective, uh, relatively to the Crusade, which is not so often uh, discussed, and. Um, in 1456, there was a, a moment of uh, halt, of se at least seemingly and temporarily, um, of the Ottoman advance at the hands of uh, the uh, voivode uh, John Oniadi, another extraordinary figure um, at the time. The Ottomans were stopped at the siege of Belgrade, and the um, and Huniadi's son Matthias Corvinus ruled over Hungary between 1458 and 1490. Um, was called to succeed um, to uh, Ladislas V, that um, and um, and he made it in this pretty turbulent moment. Now Constantinople has fallen, so the Turks are really expanding fast. Um, they um, it, he manages in Hungary to kind of grow relatively independent from the great lords. Um, I, I'm really not sure about this, but I suspect that this the Ottoman threat had to do with this. I mean, it's interesting how uh, you know this institutional systems uh, got uh, you know kind of uh, shaped up by the the external pressures. So that yeah, the nobility was fine about uh, weakening central authority. Of, of the monarchs as long as everything was you know under control now with a consistent external threat 
of an empire that functioned like a state was fundamentally collecting legacy of the Roman Empire, seizing these Im immense territories between Asia and Europe. Uh, now, it's, it's a power that the same nobility thinks evidently has to cope with, uh, although every kind of political scheme was still out there. And um, and Matthias Corvinus is a very important king, also on him we should discuss a lot, um, on Schwerpunkt, and, we, um, and he tried to make of Hungary fundamentally the center of this vast Danubian Empire that technically was, uh, that's how Hungary had, had been born uh, in, in geographical and political terms, uh, it's pretty evident, and in fact, just for telling you how the internal thing matters, where in Christianity, during the Ottoman advance, the same Hungary of Matthias Corvinus tries to expand into other countries, uh, fighting strenuously against Poland, Bohemia, and Austria. So, eventually, now we, we, we jump into, into the modern age, you know that, fundamentally, uh, after him, the, the Hungarian crown came back to the... Um, Jagiellonian dynasty with Ladislas II and Louis II that reunite actually uh, managed to reunite, uh, reunite dynastically the crowns of, uh, of, of, of Hungary, Poland and Bohemia and um, then eventually there is the, the conquest of Belgrade in 1521 at the hands of the Ottomans and if, uh, so the Danubian plain is open to Ottoman advance and the, the Hungarians are defeated at Moax or Moax in, in, tw in 1526, so after neither uh, uh, 20 years, fundamentally Bohemia is conquered uh, by two, two thirds by the Ottomans, the others go to the Austrians, but you know, fundamentally that's the descent uh, end, not of the Hungarian monarchy that actually remained eventually also in the in the Habsburgic uh, domains, but generally speaking this great medieval, I would say, I, I, I stress the term of empire for Hungary right, compared to, to to other kingdoms in because it, it had also, in, in, as we've seen before, ideologically, it, it was between two empires. This influenced also its own political um, perception, uh, mixed it with the major ideal of the steppe warriors, the steppe overlords, at the origin under roots in this great Pannonian basin, it was um, Danubian basin, it was possible to conceive such things, albeit uh, we've seen also how problematic it was to keep this such a big um, kingdom in in uh, in one uh, you know in one in one piece. So, uh, completing with Poland. So. Uh, at the death of Casimir III, known as the Great, we've seen this great, um, after, you know, Mieszko, Mieszko and um, Boleslav, you know, Casimir III is uh, conceived as, you know, one of the ma most famous uh, Piast rulers, and um, the, um, the, the, uh, the Piast dynasty ex went extinct, f fundamentally, and the continuity of the um, Polish crown was fundamentally saved by the, the Angevins at this point uh, through the union with Hungary under Louis of Anjou that, uh, and, and the Angevins uh, at, the ad of, at, at the death of Louis in, in, in 1382 the Polish crown passed to uh, his daughter Edwidge, Edwidge, uh, don't call her. So uh, uh, at this point there is this major event in European history in 1385, which is the marriage between the last, uh, the Angevin uh, heiress uh, of Poland um, with the great Duke of Lithuania, Jogaila, that with the act of Krevo of on August the 14th, 1385, in fact, uh, you unites uh, dynastically his own lands with the ones of Poland and in at the same time embracing Christianity. Yes, the Lithuanians had remained pagan formally up to the end of the 14th century. Now, unitly times had changed now the the the, uh, the option of um, uh, you know, creating this dynastic union was very uh, very profitable 
So also the Christianization was very important. This was a great, you know, Lithuania remained fundamentally swinging between East and West in this sense because uh, Poland, just like Bohemia and, and Hungary, are in this westernmost area of Eastern Europe, let's say, and they had now fully entered uh, Roman Catholicism, Catholicism in spite of all actually do doctrinal problems you find with the Hussites, for instance, but um, they they belong to that world. In fact, it's even difficult to distinguish them um, uh, to from from the rest of Central Europe in many ways. I, I was impressed in my last vacation to, to Warsaw how similar uh, Poland is to to Germany. I know it's it's strange because you know there is all the jokes about the Blitzkrieg and all Poland versus Germany, etc. But you you see that these are countries that kind of culturally belong to a very similar matrix, fundamentally. And um, Lithuania was completely different. We pointed it out before. Lithuania was a much less um, you know uh, developed area in Europe than that. In fact. Uh, the Lithuanians were pretty warlike. They had their own. Uh, they had withstood the uh, one of the few peoples that had withstood the expan the Teutonic expansion, and, and always had were troubled by that. And but they also had had another direction, for which you don't have to think that the eventual the the, the Polish conf uh, Lithuanian Confederation to be something so uh, to be given for granted, because Lit Lithuanians had also leaned and had become very close to to marry. The uh, w w into the Russian higher aristocracy and to make a, not a Polish Lithuanian, in fact, but but a Russian Lithuanian confederacy or something similar. Russia was very different. We we leave it for the last today because it's uh, particularly it's a sort of an exception. But the Lithuanians also up to the 16th century were still kind of swinging between these two areas. Just remember that these were dynastic unions. So you have seen. In the case of Bohemia, Poland, and Hungary, how quickly this could change, how many different dynasties, and so on. So this is kind of a case with Lithuania. But nevertheless, this date, 1385, stands with the Act of Kravo because it, it really shifts tendentially Lithuania towards the west. Very importantly, the Lithuanians, Yogaila, uh, tra um, embraces Roman Catholicism, could have embraced, in fact, with the Russians, the, the, the orthodox one. Uh, so this changes a lot in European history, in the balance of powers in Eastern Europe, and, and, and was one of the most, uh, legitimately one of the most important events in um, in, uh, in European uh, the European Middle Ages. Um, so uh, there is also a, a, a sort of third country that is often forgotten to this, that is Rutania. So this um, three nations, fundamentally, Poland, Lithuania, and uh, Ruthenia, were uh, associated in a sort of a federal bond that was meant to to last, in fact, till the, the partitions of Poland in, in the late uh, 18th century. So this major entity that was enormous, uh, geographically speaking, you know, stretched, in fact, from... from, from from Silesia to 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 Kiev to the Don River, so it, it was enormous. And this also, I made some videos on the the, the Polish Lithuanian military. This kind of influenced also the not just the strategies but also the tactics of this uh, confederacy. This also was very multi-ethnical, so it could could also draw its resources from several different uh, peoples that had all the different customs and traditions and so on. So an enormous power that that uh, that in spite of the increase that we have seen we would continue into Polish internal affairs of, of the aristocracy would remain functional and would also provide a you know consistent aid to the to the uh, to the fight against the Ottomans, because after Hungary was wiped out, now the Poles understood that they they could be next. So they they and in fact they fought harshly against the Ottomans, especially with what would be Moldavia today's Moldavia and those areas. Um, but also famously at the gates of Vienna. You know, but here we stick to the Middle Ages. And 
the um, the creation of this conf Polish Lithuanian Confederacy had immediately some consistent effects because, for instance, in the relations with the Teutonic Order, that gets defeated by the Polish Lithuanian army, famously at the Battle of Grunwald in 1410. Um, the same, and this this is a very important uh, moment of um, you know for the the expansion of Polish. Um, power once again, um, and uh, but also with the relations with the Muscovy that we'll deal with later. Fundamentally, uh, Muscovy found uh, at, at its eastern, at its western borders, this enormous power that intervened uh, frequently um, in um, also in its internal affairs, a lot of wars, and uh, indeed the Polish-Lithuanian Union uh, pushed much towards the east and. Um, and its frontiers, at its frontiers, so the uh, you know the consistent problems with the, the Russian world fundamentally, uh, for how it was, uh, they uh, the, the was w was being uh, was was developing in a very different ma uh, fashion, but Poland even at this time didn't solve completely his problems with uh, the German areas, as um, the Teutonic Order later Prussia, but also the Habsburgs, um, kept conditioning heavily the developments of, of Poland. Um, indeed, um, Poland was surrounded by potential enemies, uh, not much differently from uh, all the other countries at the time, but still having an enormous perimeter of its domains that had to be controlled, and this affected also the, the, the management of the situation, of the internal affairs. Um, at the same time, uh, as we've seen, there is also the Ottoman problem that comes in into the the affairs uh, in, in for, for Poland. Uh, Ladislas III, that is also elected uh, to the throne of Hungary uh, to 1440, was killed in 1444 uh, in the Battle of Varna against the Turks, as we were recalling before. Uh, we could add something else with Casimir the Ford, but let's stop in here for now. Um, well, no, let's go on. Let's say that Casimir the Ford Jagello now or Jagello ruled from in Poland from 1447 uh, to 1492, and he was the successor of Ladislas. And at this time, its Poland reaches its maximum uh, um, in terms of uh, territorial expansion as well as its uh, highest political influence for what concerned the bonds with Bohemia and Hungary that were in fact uh, ruled at the time by uh, Ladislas Jagello and uh, also it, it, over those vassal states like Moldavia and uh, the Teutonic Order that is also kind of declining. Um, so, however, from the second half of the 15th century the the aristocratic monarchy is is transformed in a sort of monarchical regime that is founded on several ordinances, so these stands of states, nobility and clergy. Um, but uh, eventually, in the 16th century, um, there is a, a further developments bring to a increasing to an increase of the uh, nobil nobiliar dominance on the uh, on the same uh, was the the, cham the chamber the parliament fundamentally so that's the uh, Poland is the the country that kind of emerges better among the ones we have observed at the end of the Middle Ages but still has this direction a macro internal direction that sees the the constant albeit slow decline of the central monarchy in favor of of the nobility. So, I left, um, we have seen the, the history fundamentally of tre these three major countries, but I left out Russia because I wanted to, to leave it now for, for last. And we, we're not gonna uh, talk about the whole uh, Russian history because, first of all, we've already discussed it, or, uh, uh, begin, began to discuss it somewhere else. Um, in, in the Medieval Slavs playlist you're gonna find everything if you're interested, but now um, I would like to point out uh, at the end of the Middle Ages, so in the late Middle Ages, the uh, you know the, the exceptionality of the Russian um, 
monarchy, uh, the, the Principality of, of, of Moscow, because this had um, a very tormented history. You know, that fundamentally, the Kievan Rus is founded back in, in the days, uh, also in here, that there is all the process of, of, of um, during the 9th to the 10th century, the 11th century is a process of Christianization. Uh, Russia draws f from the Byzantine uh, state and church in terms of political institutional models. So Russia is configured as something very, very different from Hungary, Bohemia and Poland that really in this wide uh, Eastern European area really pertain really to, to the West. Uh, there are other entities that do not work this way. Today we kind of skip them because they... Um, in, in, in this wide area of the West, there is a, the lack of a consistent, uh, you know, the, the powers that are built in this area are kind of very different from the ones that we have listed before. However, the Kevin Rus was a cluster of principalities that had a, also here, a general cohesion given by the alleged uh, uh, descendancy of the princely dynasties from, from a common origin. Uh, yeah, the Eastern Slavs now considered themselves kind of similar as well, etc. But then there is a decline towards the 13th century, uh decline that stemmed from the progressive weakening of a sort of central order that had been given, but very approximately, you know, this, this the, the Kevin Rus never encompassed really the whole Russia from Novgorod to Kiev. It was very, very... Uh, far from unity but it had kind of worked especially from Kiev that was the most important center then eventually with the Mongol invasion also in here it's like a uh, an atomic bomb falling on Russia and everything gets fragmented uh, we have explained partly this in that video on Russia and the um, the rise of the Muscovy and the Golden Horde I think that's the title that kind of explains fundamentally how this had happened especially from the Moscovite perspective. But um, let's say that um, while the Kievan Rus had had a sort of that old Slavic egalitarian mindset for which it was a sort of moment of, uh, not of republic in, in, in conceptually, but even this um, Rus Russian principalities had uh, kind of dynamism, they had kind of ha relatively healthy middle classes of traders, etc. After the Mongol conquest, Russia gets fundamentally something more, way more despotic and aristocratic in nature, uh, partly on the same influence of the Mongols. And the, in fact, the Russians at this point copy everything po in terms of institutional, political, m and even military uh, systems from the Mongols. Uh, they still are characterized, however, by a um, pe very peculiar character that, especially for what concerned the um, the the Orthodox legacy and also the Byzantine uh, the, you know, in the, the imperial legacy of Constantinople in general. So, uh, the Russians at this point in the late Middle Ages start building something uh, that is completely different from what we have seen in the other uh, Eastern European kingdoms because it's not based on this kind of typical kind of western representants of the various social stands. You have fundamentally one monarch that rules in a sort of absolute form since the beginning, like a steps overlord. Uh, this is really impressive. And uh, in fact up to that point the political institutional dynamics um, had been kind of comparable to the other European kingdoms. But, and even after the Mongol conquest, there was sort of, uh, you know, uh, things could, um, you know, could were still flu relatively fluid, also because this area was enormous. But it's really the, under the, the uh, rule, the Muscovite rule of Ivan III, known as Ivan, also even, uh, you know, the great, uh, he was great duke of, of of, of Moscow, but he he became fundamentally Tsar of all Russia, of all the Russias, as sometimes you find written. Um, because under his reign there was a process of very strong monarchical centralization was uh, launched in successfully. And this process presented 
very peculiar, um, very peculiar characters in reality. So, first of all, in in in, Mo in Moscovy and in its dependencies, you can't actually talk about a monarchy of of stands, of states, because fundamentally. In Moscow, you lack every dialogue between the Tsar and the aristocracy. Even the third managed to subdue completely the boyars, that is fundamentally the high nobility, and the Duma, so the, the assembly, the diet, uh, as it would be called uh, elsewhere, that uh, represented the same nobility. And, and therefore, this nobility had no chance to interact at least on a um, you know at a uh, institutional and juridical level with the action of government of the tsar so the the tsar's powers were characterized by a very accentuated autocratic tendency that was fed uh, by the ideological legacy of the byzantine empire that had this kind of this despotic nature of chief of the state with no, uh, you know, uh, with no intermediate form, and especially was favored also in here um, to the princes of, of the Muscovy by the uh, the Orthodox Church, that was also very active in backing this prerogative because it naturally thought that it could, and it would, in fact, it would benefit from it. Um, so uh, the the Byzantine legacy is also very important because uh, a quite unique character that the Russians had maintained, while fundamentally a being extremely Mongol influence in nature, in political practice, etc., was the church. And the idea that there was a sort of leading church, then initially was Vladimir, then eventually, I mean, it was shifted after the Mongolian conquest from Kiev to Vladimir, and from Vladimir to to Moscow and therefore directly controlled by the princes. This was like the Byzantine Empire, where fundamentally the emperor is also the head, uh, the head of the church, so he can control the church like, very differently from what was uh, everything that was happening in the West, where the church had fundamentally taken over even uh, the, the control of certain uh, uh, political matters, at, at, at least de facto. And... Um, and especially in the moment where also in the West the same power of the church was kind of decreasing. He said in Russia you have something that only starts from from this point after the you know uh, kind of the, the destruction that the, the Mongols had brought. So the, the Russians rebuilt everything uh, in their political uh, system into a uh, at one point from scratch. So fundamentally this was an advantage, at least for the aristocracies, from from those aristocracies, because also in here it is true that the aristocracies were not represented by the in the institutional at institutional level. That the tsar was kind of the only overlord, did whatever they wanted. But naturally, um, this also corresponded to other dynamics of the nature of Russian society, etc., for which the relations were merely sometimes political and military uh, or quite military by the way because uh, at that point it was a matter of lack of order overlordship you didn't need a, bo a central body you simply needed to have an army to participate to politics in this sense so it's not that of course uh, Tsarist Russia was built in one day uh, there was a constant struggle uh, from the side of the Tsars to control everything in Russia, but nevertheless this kind of succeeded pretty well at an institutional level, because there was never need of a um, of fundamentally to bargain power. It was simply seized with, with arms, and uh, therefore developing in a very, very different way. And informing even what modern Russia would have become in terms of political culture, I mean you realize that the, the, the Russian political thought is much more, you know, uh, uh, you know, direct in in certain things, in certain, um, in because it stems partly also from this kind of cultural political legacy 
of self legitimization yeah the, and which means also the you an increased use of force whereas kind of western europe force was always kind of bargained because central power was kind of weaker by certain standards albeit now in early modern europe kind of eventually the state was was built in the same Russians the beginning of the 18th century lag consistently behind and they they built their own state for the first time with Peter the Great on the Western model but it, it's still the, the the legitimization of the monarchical power that here really matters also from a strictly religious point of view this is very different from what happens in other uh, countries of Europe that also uh, during the ancien regime always had a, a religious le legitimization but they were much more secular in thought and uh, in theory and practice we, we could say and we can talk a bit by even the third if you're interested uh, even the third Vasilievich was <laughs> the great Duke of Moscow and of all Russia by this was the title fundamentally he was born in 1440 in, in Moscow and died in Moscow in 1505 who was um, son of Vasily II and he rose to throne in 1462 and he immediately directed his own efforts for in order to create a, a unitary state that could coordinate all the single Russian principalities there were really many and, and, and diverse he fought and defeated the, the Tartars between a long conflict lasting between 1471 and 87 and he um, in, he was instrumental to in fact also uh, get rid of the Mongol dominion on Russia you know that these Russian principalities had all, all been born as as um, subjects of the of the great Khan of the Golden Horde so that's where they had got gotten even this kind of autocratic models from and uh, he also fought against Lithuania that we find well, again because of what we were saying before in this interest constant interest towards the, the west uh, the east sorry uh, uh, also and especially after this confederation uh, it's a uh, unity uh, union with Poland 1494 there is this war and he um, he got himself recognized sovereign of all Russia another very important character that Russia had at this point is that it had a very few in common in turn out of um, this religious feeling you know the idea that the Russian church was something unitary also in here like in other eastern countries the church had been instrumental to form a uh, a proto-national or national conscience and Russia was mainly formed through this Christian identity this Christian Orthodox identity so this recognition was was meant to be extended all over um, through this um, also through this further religious uh, recognition and he um, he had risen to the throne in fact at only when he was only 22 uh, I mean of course uh, even the third and uh, we already said this okay what else can we say? Well, he um, in 1471 he, he occupied Novgorod. This is very important. Novgorod had been part of the uh, of the Russian principalities, but it was fundamentally a um, um, a, merch, a republic. The the prince of Novgorod had always kind of a, a weak power compared to the merchant classes. That gives you the dimension of how. Uh, also for the other uh, Eastern European countries where you have a very active uh, economical center you know the uh, an autocratic rule is difficult to achieve but in turn Novgorod had developed like a wealthy Republic that was not was very good at commerce not so much about war nevertheless it had been a very large uh, principality and um, by seizing it uh, even the third actually added an enormous amount of assets to his to his domains and, and and this kind of control over the routes that at the end of the Middle Ages uh, these years were opening uh, pretty intensely between uh, Russia and even the the, the, the far west like with, with England with Spain 
etc. for the export of Russian grain and, and stuff like that. Um, in, in 1480, there is also, interestingly enough, this defeat uh, inflicted upon the uh, Golden Horde, the Khan of the Golden Horde, Akhmat, uh, which even uh, achieves by allying himself with the um, Khan of Crimea, Mengligire. This is important because you see that, uh, from, from two points of view, one of the means and one of the results, in terms of means, what even does is to split the Mongols between each other. The Crimea um, Khanate was, uh, you know, a bit of a thing on its own. Uh, it was an emanation of the, the Golden Horde one, um, but it was also geographically separated. The, the Khanate of the Golden, War, uh, Golden Horde was around the area of Sarai, along, along the Volga, or north of the Caucasus. This was the main center. So, um, he, uh, naturally, the, the the Crimean Khanate was weaker than than the 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 Golden Horde, and um, um, but aligned with with the Russians, they managed to to defeat the the Khanate. As a result, is its fundamental importance because up to that point, the the Russians had been used to be subjected to the to, to the Great Khan. They were considering themselves uh, its subjects fundamentally. And his subjects, and this defeat is an enormous uh, political slogan, naturally, for for even that shows that the Russians can take uh, the upper hand once again, and um, and to expand autonomously, or better, under even the <laughs> under the Moscovy uh, that controls them now. And uh, just remember that that the Moscovy had emerged. I mean, Moscow was kind of the smaller and le least uh, important Russian cities back in the day, but he made it to the top, actually being backed and serving the, the Khanate of the Golden Horde consistently. That gives them so, so much power that eventually the Moscovites managed to, to, to shake off their the, the, the Mongol yoke them from themselves and to, to seize the Russia from, from themselves. So, even... Um, Eventually, as well as oh, many other uh, Russian principalities, some very important ones, the one of Vologda, the one of Ryazan, the one of Tver. So in all directions, by the way, so all, all around Moscow, if you look at the map of how Moscow expands, it's kind of, a, you know, it largely expands like uh, an oil stain all around. And the... Um, and... A, and it also achieves another a very important goal uh, in with the matrimonial strategy by marrying the um, actually the Catholic uh, princess Sophia uh, of the Paleologoi dynasty. It kind of survived at this point. This happened in 1472 that there were chunks of Byzantine territory that had survived part of the, this the, the, the imperial dynasty that had lived on. And um, and this princess Sophia was the uh, niece of Constantine the Twelfth, that had been um, the um, actually I remember it was Constantine the 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 eleventh, the last famously enough the the last uh, emperor. But maybe there was another one who was recognizing itself from another branch, like Trebizond. No was here there is a mistake in this book well whatever Constantine the eleventh who had been the last emperor of Constantinople died during the siege of 1453 a heroic kind of a heroic figure and this allowed uh, even to um, through this marriage and to and also to, granted also to his successors to feel themselves the political heirs but also the religious ones of the Byzantine sovereigns. So that's how Moscow gets the palm of the so-called Third Rome, because they had managed to shift the center of Russian church, of the Orthodox Church, let's say, into Moscow. They were uh, intermarried with the last uh, Byzantine dynasty. So th that w that's what they felt and how they had built their own political identity, cultural identity, religious identity. Um, 
the uh, in, in for, for what concerns foreign politics there is the uh, the minister say of the exterior of the international affairs Fyodor Kuritsin if I'm not wrong it's, it's pronounced should be pronounced in this way that uh, this office was known as the one of YAC the one of international relations to isolate um, the Polish Lithuanian kingdom they uh, they achieve it in part through uh, allying the Muscovy with Stephen the Great of Moldavia, thanks to the marriage with this with one of the daughters of Ivan Helena. And this treaty of friendship is extended. Uh, treaty of friendship is extended also with to Matthias Corvinus that we have met before, 1486. Um, and there are even uh, relations with Maximilian of Augsburg, Duke of Austria. And Holy Roman Emperor, and even with Denmark, which manifest uh, far-ranging interests also in the Baltic Sea. Um, so, thanks to this very clever and, and you know, perseverant uh, foreign policy, in 1494, even the third, uh, managed to beat uh, Lithuania, and he was recognized um, by the, the, the Grand Duke uh, Alexander as sovereign of all of Russia. So this is this gives you also the dimension of how um, influent was the Polish-Lithuanian Confederacy that, in fact, for for centuries kind of mm, dictated, you know, at least the conditions that could make the Tsars, you know, ruling on, on certain areas, etc. For what concerns in, instead internal affairs, even consolidated his own power, as we've seen, and it also gave uh, a new um, legislative base to Russia, the so-called, to the institution of this um, su Sudabnik, which was a, a collection of, uh, uh, it was a code of laws fundamentally emanating in 1497, that was, as you understand, very important to uh, consolidate, uh, especially at the political, administrative, and territorial level, the growing of this uh, central power the, the Tsars were, were world building and, and naturally you know also a bettering in judiciary procedures and stuff like that so very long video today and I hope to have however covered you know several meaningful parts of Eastern European history that uh, I think it's dramatically overlooked I think even today's video is very very uh, very inconsistent in terms of yeah I've been talking for how many hours four hours I don't even know because I've stopped uh, in the meanwhile so I don't have the sum of how much I've been speaking but uh, it's important in my opinion to look at that perspective because it's often ignored and as I said at the beginning of the video I will keep uh, talking about these countries w one day s more specifically hmm. I will probably reach that mostly from the military historical point of view, but the uh, also the political history of, of these countries is very, very important. And they shouldn't be treated like, oh, Eastern, Euro Eastern Europe is over there, it's distant. It's No, we, we, we want it to be fundamentally um, uh, it has to, to go on. It has to be uh, understood, it has to be studied, it has to be known, especially today. I would say that um, not only for for Europe in its political project, but in general for uh, for all of our uh, you know for the whole world. What knowing Eastern European history and culture and tradition is very important, and I uh, I must say I enjoyed. <laughs> By 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 just by saying very much my Polish vacation, and I urge you, you know, if you want to visit some cool countries, just go go to Czech Republic, go to Poland, go to Hungary, go to Russia, go to uh, all the Baltic countries are beautiful. The Balkans are also extraordinary. Serbia, Bulgaria, Romania is extraordinary. So yeah, keep it Slovakia. Last year I was in Slovakia. Um, they're very interesting. They're rich in history, especially if you're passionate about medieval history. It's it's amazing uh, to to visit them. Okay, 
maybe you know when I was in Poland uh, now the, there is not much medieval left but there is still something if you go especially in certain small centers but also it, 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 it's it's worth to go there by knowing their history by knowing um, uh, how it, it really was uh, sadly you know the 20th century produced massive damages to 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 those countries but for all the reasons that we know but uh, they're growing fast they're uh, re-expanded they also have their problems but you know we all have um, we we should get interested in all about each other and that's the reason why I I why I, I, I make these videos on Schwerpunkt with my very modest means and <laughs> and and competence because I, I believe it, it, it it's meaningful it's something we must do if we want to build a solid uh, future f for everyone and I uh, I stop it here because it sounds too much pompous and uh, you know uh, but uh, yeah uh, okay um, so for now I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye